Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pick a Side podcast. My name is Joel Moran and I'm here with River Brown, Andrew Velez, and this is now episode 359. In this episode, we are going to recap the weekend's primetime slate of NBA games. What can hold back OKC? Answering that question. LeBron reaching 40K points, Bucks improved defense, and Tyrese Halliburton struggles. Before we get into a show, this episode of the Pick a Side Podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Now, if you guys haven't heard about BetterHelp, BetterHelp is an online therapy service. And Drew, you know, sometimes we're busy during sure, the day. No doubt. We don't got the time to go somewhere in person and receive therapy. And some of us would like to receive therapy. I know it's not for everybody. For sure. But that's why BetterHelp is online. Mm-hmm. It's convenient. Mm-hmm. And with Pick a Side, you use our code Pick a Side. You're going to get 10% off your first month. What's better than that? Listen, sometimes you got to be open. You got to be vulnerable. And, and I know it takes a, a strong person to realize that. But this is a great tool to to understand that, hey, this is your first step to getting some assistance. People go through day-to-day lives. You know, people have a lot of stress, a lot of anger, a lot of built-up aggression. You know, sometimes just to go talk to somebody would genuinely help that pain. And I know from first experience, letting everything just bottle up and just let everything pile on. You could be tough. You can have these immense collapses. So better help is something that people definitely need to get in tune with, you know, cause talking to somebody could easily make the next day simpler or the, that day or that moment. Just even those little moments are important. For sure. Yeah. There, there's no shame in getting help from people. I understand that therapy is not for everybody, but it's definitely nothing to be ashamed about. At all. And it's something that has helped a lot of people in their lives. I have not gotten on my therapy path just yet, but it's something I've been wanting to do. And I understand that, uh, with therapy, you know, it is kind of expensive, but I think BetterHelp for what they offer you is worth the price. And if you go to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash pick aside, you will get 10% off your first month. So if you want to try it out, that's BetterHelp dot com slash pick aside to get 10% off your first month. Santos wants to make amends with you, Riv. Uh, I know that he's been making comments about he's been on your academy. Ass. He has. You know, whenever you want to do something, he's coming with a jab. He's throwing a no, Ryan Garcia jab. That's I won't say doing. I don't love it, but it's funny as fuck every time. They are funny. That's why I'm not too mad about it. Fair enough. But he wants to make amends with you, and, and that amends is a jersey. It and is. he got you a jersey. We have it here with us right now. I bought it. It's said to be a player that you're a big fan of. It is said to be that. Okay. Here we go. All right. Looks a little bluish. Who is this? Oh! (laughs) (laughs) You didn't got that white man. You You got got a banger. You got a banger. Oh, man. Yeah, he snapped. Oh, I got another one. I got to put this in the camera. Now, the collar is heat. That's tough. Buffalo Bills. Bills got some nice jerseys. They do. They are OD. If I was in a Jets fan, I would have had a Josh Allen jersey. I appreciate that, Santos. You know, that just means that you watch the show. You pay attention to my fandoms. And the beef is over. I'll drop the episode in April. (laughs) (laughs) I respect that. Oh, man. That's one month from now. (laughs) You know, after my birthday, 26. Nah, the funniest you know? thing was when I'm I'm talking about how I just became affiliate on Twitch, and, and Riv goes, yeah, I'm, it's, it's about time I make my appearance on there. <laughs> and Santos goes, so you can go ahead and play video games, but you can't go ahead and drop an episode of Riv Academy. <laughs> what <laughs> happened? I don't even play a lot of games. That's the funniest part. To the 2K League. We're here. Are we really? <laughs> if you would have traded me James Harden... I'd still be active in that league. I'm playing the games tonight. I'm going live. I'm playing the games tonight. I need Brandon Ingram off my team. The aura, he just destroys it. Why don't you just learn how to use Brandon Ingram? I get am going to use him. Get, get in the gym. Get in the training I freestyle. I just hate him so terribly in 2K. His shot is painfully slow. It is. You know, that's the thing about 2K leagues, and that's, that's why I'm hesitant to jump into them. Because... At first, everybody thinks it's a great idea. Dells is the the one vouching. He went on vacation, but even when he wasn't on vacation, he wasn't playing his games. Riv, I don't think he's played a game yet, and he got Joel Embiid. I played one. I thought you played yesterday. I played yesterday. I was manhandling him. 
Then his um his, his Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi went out, and I told him, bro, I'm keeping it up, bro. Yeah, yeah, was, of uh, course. It's quiet. And I told, I, I gave everybody the warning. I'm like, oh, bro, I'm gonna be honest. That happens to any one of you. I'm keeping the W. Do you want to hold Brandon Ingram? I don't have anything to give you. R.J. Barrett, Joel Embiid. <laughs> Fuck no. He's a. Would beast. you want R.J. Barrett for? What Brandon if I Ingram? gave you? Joel, I don't have R.J. anymore. What if I gave you Carl oh, Anthony to Towns and? Okay. I dead did it. What if I gave you Carl Anthony Towns and Brandon Ingram? Ooh. For Embiid? For Embiid. I don't know how to use BI. No. I'm a, I'm a beast with it. I would have did it in Embiid. two seconds. I need Brandon Ingram off the team. Of course, that's a that's a robbery for yeah, you. You're stealing. Is it? How? Yeah. yeah. Carl Anthony Towns. BI. I don't know how to use dog. BI. So I can't. Like, it would make it just really just me trading cat Fair and Embiid. I'm, and I'm a beast with Embiid. So. Yeah, I mean, Embiid is a cheat code. I yeah. bet he is. Yeah. Well, is I he do, shot quick, relatively? I don't even take, I don't take jumpers. Oh. I gave this dude, yeah, I was I mean, giving this dude kill. like 15 and 10. I was just straight, yeah. Huh. Yeah, you Carl know? Anthony Towns in my two games is averaging like 24. Uh, a problem I ran, ran into in the league is that there are some people that are inactive. They haven't played much games. And, you know, there are some people, two people that have not played a game yet in the league. I think it's the Bucks user and it's the Atlanta Hawks user. Uh, I've tried kicking them out the league, but for some reason I can't kick anybody. Okay, so you should have just, I, I'll take care of that. Yeah, so I don't know if it's a permission that you only have, because I, I know that you made me an admin. I did. So I should be able to remove people, but I guess it didn't work for me. It just always, like, even when I remove them for the league, they just are yeah, still in and that's there. huge, because I know JC was talking about wanting to get in it. So, listen, we make moves. If you're not playing, see you later. We need to make it active, man. We need to make it active. I need Brandon Ingram off my team. If you're in the league and you're listening, get Brandon Ingram off my team. Send me offers. I don't want him. You know, I I don't think I told you guys a story, but when we were drafting in the league, I sniped Drew. He wanted James Harden. I heard he wanted James Harden on stream. Fucking bastard. And I sniped him. Mm. But only because Anthony Edwards wasn't available. But guess what? In the first round, Ant-Man was off the board. I drafted Harden. I drafted Bam out of bow in the second round. And then I traded Bam out of bounds somebody else for Anthony Edwards. So now I have two first round picks on my team, essentially two bucket getters. I don't have no big man depth. So, you know, I have Goga Bataze, uh, yeah, Christian I'll, Coloco. I'll kill you. Yeah, but then your guards will not keep up with James Harden. I lock up. Anthony Edwards. I really play defense. Who do you have on your team that's defenders? Nobody. I just know how to play defense. You like, have a Sar Thompson. I put him, I had him on stuff. No, you don't have a Sar. I traded RJ for him. Like when in a Today? Heartbeat. And I was like the day I jumped on. No, bro, because uh, what's his I, name? I was just playing with Asar. I'm trying to tell you. I suck toes has Asar. And no, and we traded. Interesting, because he was offering him yesterday. Yeah, you're cooked, buddy. I have Asar Thompson. Okay. He can't shoot. I don't need him to shoot. He just plays defense cuts. He actually dunked. He When I was playing Angel, he dunked on like three of his players. Oh, damn. So you beat Angel. Yeah, he's not good. I was going to say, he's been chatting like he's the he greatest. Was, he was since running his mouth, bread. and I had to go in there and t- <laughs> like, teach, teach him game. Like, he was trying to disrespect me. And I'm like, bro, I'll When play are defense. you going to get in the wreck, bro? I don't have a mob player. Can you make one? Maybe. I said, I'm about to start joining the streams. I was well, that's what get, I'm saying. I was waiting for you to get to a respectful following to get to me. And then what it makes you think that I'm going to put you on the stream after saying some shit like that? Because I'm that's funny, and I bring. I it's bring okay. high energy. I'm, we're, I'm doing okay as is. That's what I'm saying. But to get my me, you had to get a certain. See, you know like this is this guy. Might, you might be ixnated from my stream forever <laughs> until you apologize. No, I'm just kidding, bro. Uh-huh. I'm happy. To, I'm just happy to be there. You know. Yeah, for sure. But like I said, you make a my player. <laughs> we can get in the pro am. We can start running private What's matches position? and shit. I want to run them all. Okay. All right, but I just want the ball. Okay, but well, you're gonna have to pass. I just all I want. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a point. I just like to touch. Was the that ball. a shot at his in real life play style? Wow. Maybe forty and slip, but not really. No, nah, no, nah, you do. Uh, but I'm saying in in general, like the point guard, it's it's tough, especially if they're playing zone. I'm good, bro. Okay, but I understand that. But you don't have a my player. Don't worry about. Do you play that. against zones. I played against zones before. It's horrible. Are you not good? I'm good, but I'm letting it be known it's not an enjoyable time. Sometimes don't worry about. It. I love all the responsibilities. Last night I had I had a couple games where I dropped thirty, but then the last two games of the night I was streamed for like four hours at this point. Garbage. He's probably tired. I was. Man, it I hurt. wish we had uh, the league was 29 games, though. Why? Because so I, your... could, I could play people in the East and West. Yeah. Oh, you already blew your load and played all 14? I play 12. I only need two more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I beat you when I didn't have Ant-Man. If we, <laughs> if we match up again, Ant-Man's killing me. Well, Bam <laughs> was a big reason why I lost. I, I know, but I'm telling you. Because like, Carl Anthony Towns, you would have legitimately had nothing to do with him. No, no, I, I wouldn't have, but... My perimeter attack 
is just too good uh-huh. when I have both of them. Like, I'm talking about reigning threes. And in our league where you have to play on ball, it's almost impossible if you're going to... The thing that bothers me about you or bothered me when we played was you weren't doing any right stick dribbling. You just said left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Couldn't do shit. I can't follow you, <laughs> especially with fucking Harden. That shit was pissing me off. And then I had Fred on him. Yeah, it was barbecue. Uh, but, yeah, if you didn't have... Bam out of bio against Carl Anthony Towns, he might have given you 40. No, yeah, he probably would have. Yeah, but I'm telling you, Goga can hold his own. It's a good team. Goga Pataze can hold his own. And then on a perimeter, I'm good with Caruso and Ant Man. Again, they lock Carl up. Carl Anthony Towns. All right. With Goga Bataze? Can we get fucking serious? Goga's a good defender. No, you're disrespecting him now. In 2K? If you oh, want. We are talking about 2K. If, if you want, later on tonight, we can void the original match, and we can match up again uh-huh. with the new, with my new roster. Oh, okay. We can see this what's up. It, it could be, it could be on stream. Crazy. Oh, crazy. Let's see if he Cat gives me stream, forty. He'll beat you. Uh, I need Bi off the team before I play another game. <sighs> I can't play another game until he's gone. I will play, but once Bi is, you gone. gotta just train him for like Herbert Jones or something. I'll do anything for Herb Jones instead of Bi. Actually, I will give you Westbrook. <sighs> I want that. Okay, <laughs> Russell Westbrook is terrible. I'll be, I'll Nobody wants Isaiah, Isaiah Joe. Nobody wants Bi. That's good. That's, that's good. No, I Isaiah got, Joe's. A, I really ain't got shit. I'm not trading Bi. He was my second round pick. No, I, I say a joke. Can he can light it give up? A fuck. He can light it up from three. I'm not trading no fucking Bi for auto drafted sixth rounder. Probably, maybe fifth. He's starting nine overall. Respect him. He was definitely a, a nice role player pick. You want Norman Powell? No, nah, his jump shot is too slow. Ugh, I hate him, actually. It really is slow. It's not good. Nah, is, I saw Drew. Well, when Drew was drafting his team, I was like, God damn. I, need, I wanted Buddy Hill badly. His My jump team shot is, is beautiful. Listen, you can't chat like that. Like, our game wasn't fucking right down to the wire. Calm it down, Brandon buddy. Brandon Ingram, the pick, I, I knew you wasn't going to like him, bro. When you drafted him. <laughs> I, how was I supposed to know that he has the longest shot in 2K history? Your first three picks were Cat. Ingram and Van Vliet. Yeah. Van Vliet actually played very well against you. Van Vliet, Van Vliet I just, I've never been able pick. to use him in 2K. He played well against you. I was actually stunned. Because yeah. the game before that, I, I he got injured, and Pat Bev <laughs> took his minutes, and Pat Bev was elite. <laughs> nah, it's just a small miniature guard that isn't that fast. It's just tough to play with them I in 2K. I think I might wear this jersey tomorrow. Freddie? Oh, no, Josh, Josh Allen. Allen? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm almost in the playoffs in my Madden League. I'm like two weeks away. I'm 10. I have 10 wins right now. So I'm I'm, I'm a lot to make the playoffs. It's about winning the division. But, yeah, I'm feeling good about my chances, man. I'm trying to get this 2K League ramped up for the playoffs. I want to play my playoff game already. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I, there's only a couple teams in the West that I'm a little bit worried about. The SGA user, the Giannis user, and there's somebody else that beat me. I think he got Paul George. Guy's not respecting me. He's like, nah, don't worry about it. No, nah, I, I, I won again. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we could play tonight. We could play tonight. It was a close ass game, bro. I didn't have another with my second best player being irrelevant, bro. I didn't have another player that could score. Like as much as Bam impacted the game defensively, I could not get a bucket. Like I really could not get a bucket. If it was not Harden, mm. I could not get a bucket. And part of your success is think you should be thanking me. Because you missed no, the three? No, because you drafted Harden because I wanted him. Yeah. Yeah, and he's you're realizing he's fucking nasty. If Anthony Edwards was there, though, I wasn't drafting Harden. You was going to have him. And I'll be honest, fold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wish <laughs> Edwards fell to me. I only mean that in the sense Harden is OD. No, I yeah. actually prefer Harden over the cream of the crops. He's more he's more consistent at generating a basket for me yes. than Ant Man. His post fade, I mean, excuse me, his regular uh, fade is fire. Yeah. His jump shot is clean. His passing's great. He can he can dunk the basketball. Yeah. You drive, you can still yam with him. It's pretty unrealistic. We, not, could, we could play tonight though. I'm, let me trade Bi and we can make it happen. So you have to trade Bi. I need situation. him traded before I play yeah. a singular game more. You need to get up in that PAS League Discord and start chatting. I up. get in that Discord, you need uh, to start but I'd be, up. I'd be in the wreck, and we'd be balling the fuck out. You need to start looking for some trades. I fucking hate that team, man. Because the first day we got on on, on a my league, Bam on a bio. I said he's on a block. The Ant Man user told me he wanted him. I was like, Ant Man, okay, I'll, 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 it's fine. I think I spoke to him. I think that was dumb. Dom was the one that gave you that, right? That might have been, yeah. Facts. And I, I got Jonathan Kaminga. So, you mm-hmm. know, if, if Riv wants to come shop, 
I got Jonathan Kaminga. I ain't got shit to shop, but I'll try to see what I could cook up. I got Kaminga. He's been doing his thing. The first topic of the show, uh, this weekend there was a lot of uh, prom Good time basketball. NBA games. Yes, a lot of great basketball games, basketball matchups, even though some of them weren't the best games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nuggets, Lakers, Sixers, Mavericks, Warriors, Celtics, Knicks, Cavs, and Thunder, Suns. What is one thing you learned the most from this weekend's matchups, Drew, I'll start with you. You, you know, was very antsy and uh, giddy to start. I'm very glad to talk about this now. I say that a little ironically where I watched my Lakers lose a heartbreaker. We were winning essentially this entire game versus the Nuggets, and then the last four minutes of the game, we implode, and we can clutch up to save our lives. Darvin Ham really is something special. I, I mean, taking D'Angelo Russell out, who's been one of our best players for the, for the entirety of 2024, for Cam Reddish to not even play primarily on Jamal Murray, uh, whatever. Let, let me not harp too much on that. That was a tough loss. But what I really wanted to talk about was your guys over there in Dallas. Uh, I, I say I'm so excited to talk about them because in the two games they played, Friday and Sunday, uh, lost both. Losing to, who was that? Who was that first team, actually, uh, by, by double digits? But then on Sunday, oh, losing to a team that doesn't even have their best player. Wow. And, and it's funny because post-trade deadline, they were supposed to be better. Mm. They got not one, but according to Joel, two impact defenders. Daniel Gafford, absolutely. But then P.J. Washington, who was supposed to be a great defensive ad for them. But why is it? That post All Star break, we're talking about the worst defense in the association in the Dallas Mavericks. To me, you lose by double digits to a team that you've been talking nothing but trash on this entire 2024, talking about the Boston Celtics. And don't say that, oh, you, you, there's no way that they can lose. I really like the Boston Celtics when we know your true opinions to get absolutely washed by the Boston Celtics and then lose to the 76ers, allowing Tobias Harris and Tyrese Maxey to combine for over 50 points on their own. And then off the bench, you have Kelly Oubre to give him a, a nice 20 ball uh, to add on to that, too. It's time for concern for your Dark Horse team uh, because they're all healthy. Everything seems to be okay, but they're not playing defense, which was supposed to be addressed at this trade deadline. That's my biggest takeaway because there got to be genuine concerns, especially when you have a top four player in the world, arguably the best in some people's eyes, and Luka Doncic. So I just want them to understand that. I'm locked in in understanding that if this want if this team really wants to be a dark horse, you can't do that with zero defense. Now listen up, Drew. Yes, I'm listening. My real opinion about the Celtics, <laughs> I've been consistent all year long. Riv, tune in just to make sure that we're here. Okay, here we go. They are the best team in the NBA right now. Are they your what, championship what, favorites right now? They might be. They they might not be. What we kind gonna, of fucking answer is that? We gonna see when we get closer to playoff time. When we make our playoff brackets, we'll see. Where I am a we Lakers fan. I want the Lakers to finishing. win the finals. My favorites to win are the Celtics. That's an answer. All right, that's good yours. for you. That's good for you. Now, can I have you? Who's your favorite right now? Right now, it's between the Nuggets and the Celtics. If you had to pick one, gun to your head. I want to make that decision at a later time. I, I don't feel pressure to make that decision right now. You can have a favorite. It doesn't mean that you're picking them. This guy's nuts. I don't know what he's talking about. Right? I'm, yeah, what's, I don't know what who is your favorite to win it right now? The, the Boston Celtics. Yeah. Who is your favorite to win it right now, Mr. Moran? I'm going to hold off on my opinion. This guy is unbelievable. Know what what's wrong with him? My consistent opinion has been this has been the best team in the league. I mean, you're not going to try to trick me into thinking that I said something different. All I said is that the best team in the league. Have I said things about Jason Tatum? Absolutely. Their best player. I you have, have reservations on. Yes, because I've seen the best player on their team in back-to-back 50-point wins. Wouldn't that mean you have reservations and, about the Boston in Celtics? In the first quarter, no, because I know this team is great. If, if injuries don't derail this team, I think they should win the finals. Last episode, we talked even about with the Boston a, Celtics. A, a 33% chance that Tatum could play bad? Yes, even with that. Because okay. they're so absurdly talented. Uh, last episode, we had a topic. Can anyone stop the Celtics? What did I say? I said themselves. That was my answer, Drew. Uh, this this Mavericks uh, hate from you. It's not hate. It's it's acknowledgement of the truth. You know, it can be the truth. Thank you. That's all I'm asking. But you know what? It comes off as hate because when they're doing well, 
I know, give acknowledge- I, 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 I give acknowledgement. You, I see you smiling cheek from cheek. You know, Daniel Gafford, that was the biggest move, bigger than anything they made. It was. You're acknowledging all these things, but as soon as they have a little turbulence on the road, mm. you start to come out and you talk all high and mighty. I told you. Have I been high on this good. team? This team's not Have good. I been high in the Mavericks at all? them playing too. Multiple times. So you know what? This is the truth about the Mavericks is that they're going to find a way. Because Better figure it out soon. after the All-Star break, they lost a heartbreaker against Cleveland, a Max Struess buzzer Prayer. beater, uh-huh. 15 points in the fourth, five Masterpiece. threes. Masterpiece. I mean, he just lit it up. He did. But the silver lining in all this is that the Mavericks, despite four losses in the five, past five games, the starting lineup of Luka, Kyrie, Josh Green, PJ, and Lively in 72 minutes – have a 133.3 offensive rating, 112.9 defensive rating, a plus 20.4 net rating. They have a starting lineup that works. It's a shame they can't play all 48. Compare that to last season uh, or earlier this season. Uh-huh. They're starting five with Luka, Kyrie, Derek Jones Jr., Grant, and Lively. 108.7 offensive rating, terrible. 111 defensive rating and a minus two net rating. Ironically enough, Derek Jones... Was a heater for them off the bench this past Sunday. He was solid. And listen, I think the Mavericks problems these past two games have stemmed from poor coaching. I think Jason Kidd is playing too much into a small ball lineup. Fair. You traded for Daniel Gafford for a reason. Agreed. It's so he could play solid backup center minutes. Instead, they're rolling out Maxi Kleba at the five lineups and he's getting torched. And they can't stop anything on defense. They don't have any rim protection. They can't, they can't stop shots in the paint. Against Boston, we saw Boston catch on fire like a team. I hadn't seen a team catch on fire like that in a long time. They did the same thing against Golden State because Golden State deployed a game plan to sag off of Jalen Brown, and he made them pay. Steve Kerr did it. Yeah, yeah and Idiotic. Draymond agreed with it too. Draymond said he thought that was a sound plan. So I, don't, I, don't, I just think that just you just defending your coach. I really don't think Draymond did that. Turn shit. on the goddamn film. What are you sagging off at Jalen Brown for? Yeah, that's crazy. So the Mavericks, yeah, the the loss against Philadelphia that wasn't a that wasn't a good loss. They they gave them a fight down the stretch, but they couldn't get a defensive stop. But I think if they play more big, they'll be more of a solid team. And I think Tim Hardaway Jr., it comes a point in time where Jason Kidd has to be honest yep, with himself. I'm with you here. And he has to be honest with THJ. And he can't play as many minutes as before because he is somebody that takes the most ridiculous shots. His shot selection is so poor, and they just need more consistency. And his defense has been atrocious. Yeah, I, I like Dirk Jones Jr. in his spot over Tim Hardaway Jr. I know he can catch fire, but the inconsistencies from him is a real issue. The thing I learned from uh, this uh, weekend slate of games is that the Nuggets can turn it on whenever they want to turn it on. And we saw that against the Lakers. I mean, isn't it ironic that the two games where LeBron is making history, passing Kareem, and then going for 40K points, they lose both of them. Almost every historical mark for LeBron we've lost. Yeah, they, they lose those games. But you look at Jokic. 35-10-7, 35-10-7, the Nuggets scored 35 points in the fourth quarter, Murray 24-11. This year, Denver is 14-0 when Jamal Murray scores 24-plus points or more. He averages 25 in the playoffs. So we're talking about the Nuggets are undefeated when they get playoff Jamal Murray playing at that level in the regular season. This team can turn it on whenever they want. For and sure. the other takeaway is that uh, Tom Thibodeau, he deserves more credit. I, I mean, th- this is a guy that came to the Knicks Julius Randle has an all-NBA season with him. Jalen Brunson gets signed. People thought it was an overpay. He becomes an all-star, all-NBA level player under Tom Thibodeau. DiVincenzo having the best season of his career under Tom Thibodeau. Josh Hart, same thing. Yep. Hartenstein, same thing. Preston Achua, I feel like he's looked the best he's looked in the NBA under Tom Thibodeau. I mean, he gets a lot of slack for the amount of minutes he plays his guys, whatever. I think some of that at this point has become false narrative. But he's legitimately made the Knicks a consistent team that has an identity and a culture. And players that come here, they get better. And that win against Cleveland where Josh Hart has a triple-double. DiFincenzo goes off for 20-plus points. Boyan makes an impact. I mean, Riv, as a Chicago Bulls fan, you saw firsthand even 
when Thibodeau didn't have his guys, Derrick Rose was out. Yep. You had everybody step Dave up Robinson and still have to and still win games. And that's what Thibodeau brings to the Knicks. Even with all these injuries, uh, I trust Thibodeau because he's always going to have a sound game plan every single game. And against Cleveland, it, it showed. And I feel like we kind of still have Cleveland's number. There's still some type of psychology there with Cleveland that they just don't think they can mess with us. We have a level of physica physicality that we get to that they cannot match. I wish Darius Garland started to take shots in the second and third instead of the fourth, but, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, for no, sure. I meant to talk to you about that. If there was ever a time for DG to catch up to Mr. Halliburton over there, it's right the fuck now. Yeah, Especially he, with Don being out, this is his time to he really... He doesn't want to be aggressive. Actually. Which makes no sense to me. He was aggressive last game in the yep, fourth. I know what you're talking about. And in the two games before that, mm -hmm. he just... I don't know. Um, but, yeah, Tibbs... He's always been that type of guy. You know, the rosters we had with Nate Robinson, Kirk Heinrich, we always made the playoffs. I remember, you know, he was running out. Joe Kim Noel was an MVP candidate one year. And the year we beat the Nets in seven games, you know, our offense was one of the worst offenses in the league. So, you know, Tim has always showed this just floor raising in the regular season. You know, he's always been able to do it. As long as you give him a great defense, he'll he'll pull out wins. Um, my biggest takeaway from this, you know, and I think it's interesting, is the Minnesota – Timberwolves offense in the fourth quarter. It's probably one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. It's very much, that's obviously hyperbole, but it's very hard to watch at times. And I had to rewatch it to see what it was. And it's just really like, I'm watching it right now. It's like a collection of just bad, like Mike Conley is, is a point guard. He's a playmaker. And I've, I'm watching this fourth quarter and he's, he's seen as a spot up shooter. You know, he's not a guy that's, kind of within the offense, you know, he's not getting them settled Directing. down, mm -hmm. understanding he, he's just one of their shooters. And they have Ant-Man and Cat running the O. And they're just not at that that level yet consistently as playmakers, just as decision makers, just as like the next free, looking at the next free. They're just not there yet, which is fine. You know, Ant is like 22 years old, 23, so he'll get there eventually. But they're just not there yet. And um, I think it's interesting because this is a situation that could, like this was Clippers, Minnesota, Big game. This was a 19, 1990s game. You know, the score was extremely low. Yeah. The defense was there. You know, neither team shot well. Kawhi had a great game and had a good game for the most part. But neither team shot well. And just like Cat not being aggressive on guys, he like Paul George was legitimately locking him up in the fourth quarter. Like him not being aggressive in these type of matchups would be is bothering me a little bit. But I'm not gonna you know look too much. That's just you know it's February. It's March. Excuse me. Playoffs are in the month. You know, you got to start playing playoff basketball, you know. Um, but to be fair, the Clippers, in, in their last 18 games in the clutch, 14-4 and four record, plus 44.4 net rating, defensive rating of 95.7. So they've kicked it up. They were 2-8 and eight to start. And then, you know, the Timberwolves, their last 10 games in the clutch, you know, 3-7, and seven, minus 28.8 net rating, offensive rating is 95.7. So their offensive rating is is the Clippers' defensive rating. It's, it's the same numbers and opposite. Their field goal percentage was 37%. They were 12-4 and four in their first 16 games in the clutch. And now these last 10, they haven't been good. They've been, you know, stalling at the wrong time. You know, we, we talk big about how teams, it's all about, you know, getting hot at the right moment. You know, we say that for football. And in the NBA, that, that shit matters too. You know, the Lakers got hot at the right moment. The Heat got hot at the perfect moment. The Celtics got hot, and then they went on their run. You know, teams do it, so... Minnesota, they definitely need to get it together and figure out their fourth quarter woes as of late. But, uh, you know, still being a top two seed, you know, so they'll be okay with that. Let me ask you a question uh, a little bit on topic because you mentioned the Clippers versus Minnesota game. And, of course, you mentioned the the Timberwolves. But let me talk to you about the Clippers real quick because you, you mentioned how they've been in the clutch recently. But I want to highlight Paul George because yes, yes, yes. for about a month and a half, it, it seems as if he his game has just been nowhere near – to the level we saw earlier on in the season. Is there a level of concern? Um, yes, in terms of him being hurt. Because mm -hmm. I know in the beginning of February, he was dealing with a, For sure. a groin injury. Mm -hmm. He was playing through it. Then, um, you know, got hurt. with uh, I forgot the last injury he had, but he missed a couple games. Mm -hmm. Came back, had a good game. It's definitely been concerning because the injuries are starting to bother him. And they're starting to bother his play. And I know he wants to play through it and stuff like that. But um, it, honestly... The thing that always is troubles with this team is if Harden and PG, you know, 
wet the bed, then this is going to be a team that could legitimately lose too early than what it needs to be. So these two guys need to be the healthiest they can be, especially with a team that doesn't have the same depth that it has. You know, it's going to rely heavily on these three guys and then the rest of their three, four players that they have. But um, definitely these this last month or some changes definitely has concerned me. One, because of the simple fact that he's, you know, he's not he hasn't had a good shot quality over the past month. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he's dealing with some nagging injuries that you can play through. But obviously, they're affected. The other one was the knee soreness. Mm -hmm. Yes, there. That's what it was. That's why I picked the Clippers to be the team that I think is most likely to be upset in the first round. Because I think Kawhi, you trust Kawhi. Harden was 0 for 10 against Minnesota. Mm -hmm. In the playoffs... He has a history of not showing up. That's just the truth of James Harden. He has some games where he's going to show up in a big way. But when he's in a role where he's asked to not be the primary scorer, the mentality changes for him. He's passive. He's not aggressive. Yep. That's why we saw Harden was at his best in Philadelphia when Joel B was out. And that's when he took over. But in this role in, in with the Clippers, when you have Kawhi Paul George, who you're relying on to be those scorers, Harden is going to be far more timid in the playoffs, and there's going to be moments where you want more from him. And Paul George, chalk it up to injury. I, I think there's just regression in his game right now from an athletic standpoint. Of course, he's not the same athlete he once was. Outside of that one run with the Clippers where he went to the WCF and he was phenomenal in that run, he does have a history of not showing up in the postseason in the biggest games. And I feel like... If you get stinkers from those guys, it's going to be really hard to mask the weaknesses of this team because this team has legitimate weaknesses. And that's why at first when it was on a hot streak, I had a lot of confidence in them. But now I'm starting to be a little bit more reserved on them because I don't know how much I can really trust this team. It just feels like something bad is bound to happen with them in regards to whatever, you know, bad Harden performance, bad PG performance. We know those bad Kawhi performances are outliers and rare, but Zubac being brought up on defense, trying to guard a pick and roll and him being outplayed off the court. Then now you have to either have Tice or Mason Plumley in the game. I mean, there's just a lot of things with this team that I, I just, I, I don't know. Like I know the talent is there, but I don't really trust this team. Yeah. I think um, I would take a different approach. I think PG is, regressing in the IQ department, I think... Which the, makes no sense. You should get older, you should get smarter. Yeah, and I think his shot quality is just bad right now. You know, the type of shots he takes, he has mismatches and decides to take a, you know, a tough, difficult mid-range. And I know he likes to get flashy, he likes to play a little finesse. But I don't think his game right now is predicated on his athleticism, is predicated on the jumper. And he's a rhythm player, so if the if he's not in rhythm, he will play like shit. Like, mm -hmm. there's just no way to, to bounce around it. But yeah, it, this team is very... Hit or miss, because, um, you know, you trust Kawhi. The Harden and PG are kind of like, yeah, you may trust him, you may trust him not. Maybe like games one, two, three, four, you trust him. Five, six, seven, you're like, all right, you know, you're, you're feeling a little dangerous about it. But, you know, this team, it's it's tough because they can get a favorable matchup. Like they play the Suns, that's a tough matchup. You're going up against a, a formidable big three. But uh, I think both of these teams offensively, like in the fourth quarter, they need to figure it out because both of these teams have shown a different – level a different a lack of inc a, a lack of consistent play in different spectrums so the clippers in the beginning of the year starting to figure it out now mm -hmm. minnesota in the beginning of the year they uh unbelievable was unbelievable mm -hmm. now in the back end they're starting to struggle a little bit so both teams and they both teams kind of play in the sense of they may make a lot of bad iq plays just not smart basketball plays so they definitely need to figure it out the biggest thing that happened this weekend was lebron james hit forty thousand. oh yeah and i feel like at this point um there really is no argument for Michael Jordan being the GOAT ahead of LeBron James. I think if you want to compare peak for peak, you can. But I think in terms of just sheer longevity, it's, it's clear that LeBron James is the greatest basketball player to ever live. Now, Drew, you can speak on it more. It's a shame that when he hits these milestones, they can't win and finish <laughs> off these Christ. games. Uh. But, you know, LeBron James reached another milestone. First player in history to reach 40,000 points. I mean, it just speaks to his longevity. Only player with 40,000, 10,000 rebounds and 10,000 assists, of course. The the idea that there'll ever be another LeBron James, I mean, you, you just got to look at the, the sheer dominance over 21 years. Now, you guys know my answer. You know my GOAT will always be LeBron James. Uh, but, Joel, I, I love hearing you feel the same way in terms of what, what more can you argue against him? The only thing that ever gets brought up is that 
He's four and six in the NBA Finals. He doesn't have the same number of rings as Michael Jordan does. And I guess, you know, to an extent, I understand, because you look at a, a career of 6-0 and in the NBA Finals, the allure of never having a Game 7, the fact that he walked off his last game as a Chicago Bull as a game winner and also a, game, uh, a very clutch steal, arguably, in my opinion, the greatest two-play sequence in the history of basketball. But I look at LeBron James and what he's been able to accomplish over 21 years, the longevity, the fact that we've yet to see a fall off in his game. I understand on the defensive side of the ball, he's not that he doesn't have that same drive that he once did. But I'm having this conversation with Raven. Another thing that people like to point out in terms of LeBron, uh, in terms of Jordan versus LeBron is the fact that Jordan has that DPOI, and people feel like Jordan is just the the better defender. But there are not many players in NBA history that have the defensive versatility of LeBron James. The fact that he was an elite perm defender. And then for his size, to be such a presence down low as well. Yeah, I mean, you really can make the firm argument. This is not, he's the best two-way player. He's the best player, period. The size, the athleticism, the sustained excellence. You guys know where I, where I stand. I mean, the resume speaks for itself. I've been on this show how many times to tell you the list of accolades for LeBron. So let me not bore you. 40,000 points. The goal of the game is to score the basketball. And there's been nobody to do it more than LeBron James. Um, I think 40,000 is dope. Fucking nuts. Yeah, I think that's accomplishment. That's something that we're not going to probably see in our lifetime. You know, get beat probably in the next lifetime. Nobody in the league, I think, will be able to do it now. It'll be somebody coming up, like, down the road that might possibly be able to do it. I think the conversation between Michael Jordan and LeBron has become a little bit boring because I think people kind of take a, a pretty weird approach to it. I think it's kind of like people nowadays do the, okay, let me bash MJ and let me bash LeBron Ridiculous. as much as I can. Should never do instead that. of just seeing which guy is better talking about their games. I think the conversation has always been, though, peak Versus longevity. You know, I th M MJ doesn't have the long... He played 12 and a half seasons. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have the, you know, longevity of LeBron. He doesn't even have the longevity of Kobe or Tim Duncan or Kareem. Like, if, if longevity was a big impact, Kareem would be over MJ. But it's not. It's always been... For MJ, it's always just been he has... The if not peak. one, two mm -hmm. or two, he has either one or two, the greatest peak we've ever seen. Like to just go on a run like that, six championships, you know, six finals MVPs, five MVPs, stuff like that. So it's really just what do you prefer? Do you prefer the long 21 career of LeBron James or do you prefer the, you know, the peak? I'll take the short run of Michael Jordan. I think that's always how it's that's how it should be, you know, for people who want to talk the conversation. And I think. If you want to talk about like who they are as players, like me and Drew were talking about before, I think it's always a cool conversation to have because they're both two different type of players. You know, LeBron's an all around do it forward. MJ's a two way threat, so it's always interesting to have the conversation. But you know, LeBron's gonna have this time to just keep stacking up the resume, keep stacking up the resume, and um, you know, he, if he's not two or one, like he's either one or two in your eyes, he can't be nothing less than that. Um, for me though, I just like. They're like a one A one B thing. I don't like. I don't really care for the debate because I feel like, like I said before, the debate has become bland and it's like there's no real truth to it. There's just people bashing one, people bashing the other, and it's kind of like it's never no genuine conversation about the two. But who gets bashed more of the two? I feel like that's easy. I think people now it's LeBron. To take the LeBron bashing. Yeah, mm -hmm. LeBron. I think it depends. I think LeBron gets bashed, but MJ definitely gets bash too i think it's like now it's even i think it used to be lebron mm -hmm. for sure like i think lebron used to get violated like le legitimately destroyed but now i think people like people who bash lebron now are just old heads who refuse to and, watch the game and, anymore and i think to that point the fact that he's 39 the fact that he's still playing at yeah. this level it's kind of made people come back down to earth and mm -hmm. think man why have we been taking this for granted just appreciate for so exactly we don't have much long of it Anymore, no. he's really, he's 39 years old, the year 21. Understand that it's coming to an end sooner than you may think. And as a LeBron fan, I feel like I I hold with the idea that I don't really like to bash Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've really tried to do my homework and understand the career because this is my, this is what I think is the, the greatest of all time. Let me do my due diligence and understand where people are coming from in Jordan's side. And God, there is a hell of an argument because that man's career is near flawless. But, but I just take the, into account the size, the the, the athleticism, the, the two-way ability, just the sheer athleticism, the longevity. It, it, to me, it really is easy. You know, uh, I just feel like in the moment, 
you get lost in celebrating a player when you're at odds against that player. A mm-hmm. uh, perfect example is you when Patrick Mahomes right now. You know, you can make that same argument. Fair. Patrick Mahomes is the GOAT in the NFL. When Tom Brady played in the NFL, everybody hated Tom Brady. They did. Until he went to Tampa Bay, I still think people hated Tom Brady then. Agreed. Uh, but he was hated for his, his career. LeBron making the decision to go to Miami, he was universally hated. It wasn't until he went back to Cleveland and that kind of... Right, I would wrongs. say I would mm-hmm. say wrote wrote his wrongs, but I would say more so Kevin Durant going to Golden State gave everybody a new person to universally hate. Shout out. So I feel like KD <laughs> he kind of took that took that sword instead of LeBron from that point forward because now I, I feel like the most criticized player in the league is Kevin Durant, even at his age I agree. and for what he's doing. Uh, LeBron James forty thousand points. I thought it would be fun to go back and to look at what the NBA looked like when he hit 10,000 points, 20,000, 30,000, and of course right now, 40,000. So he had 10,000 points against the Celtics in 0708. He hit 20,000 against the Warriors in 2012-2013. He hit 30,000 against the Spurs in 2017-2018, and he hit 40,000 against the Nuggets just the other night. So in 2007-2008, when LeBron reached 10,000 career points, top five in MVP voting, number one was Kobe, mm. number two was Chris Paul, number three was Kevin Garnett, number four was LeBron, number five was Dwight Howard. The Paul. rookie of the year that year was Kevin Durant. When he hit 20,000 points, top five in MVP was LeBron. He won it that year. KD, Carmelo, Chris Paul, Kobe, the rookie of the year was Damian Lillard. Ooh. That year. Only unanimous rookie of the year. When he hit 30,000, top five in MVP was Harden, LeBron, AD, Dame, Russell Westbrook, and the, and the rookie of the year was Ben Simmons that year. Okay. And recently, just now, a hit of 40,000, top five in MVP is Jokic, SGA, Giannis, Luka, Tatum. That is crazy. And Wemby is going to be rookie of the year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about in all these eras, I mean, Kobe, rest in peace to Kobe, mm-hmm. Chris Paul, this is his last season in the NBA. Kevin Garnett has been retired for God knows years. how long. Uh-huh. Years. Dwight Howard is over there playing in China right mm-hmm. now. He's been he's been out of the NBA for a while. Second go around when he hit 20,000 points. KD, he's still playing at an elite level. For sure. But the fact that LeBron hit 10,000 10, when KD won Rookie of the Year. And now KD is looking like he's on his way out sooner rather than later. Carmelo Anthony has been retired. Chris Paul... In his last season, Kobe rest in peace again. And 17-18, Harden was MVP this year. Harden is not the same player anymore. For sure. Anthony Davis started in MVP with the Pelicans. Dame was fourth in MVP. Russell Westbrook, fifth in MVP. We're talking about a player in Dame who he's now on the older side. LeBron James has transcended generations. And for him to have these milestones and to look at where the NBA was at at each respective milestone is really impressive for for his body of work. I like that you did that. That was dope. You like it? Yeah. I appreciate it. That was dope. You had to do your research for real for real to go get that. 10,000 points when KD was rookie of the year right. is funny. Bro had to start with 10,000. That's tough. And hitting 40K and also being player of the week because not just mm-hmm. because you hit 40K, but because you've been on a crazy run recently. I mean, sure. the Lakers have been playing some strong basketball, yeah. nine wins in their last 13 games. I mean... To be at this age and be this great, it, it, it's breaking science. He's doing something we've never seen. I think going forward, we'll start to see it a little bit more than what we've seen in the past, but never at this level. The only hope would be the Kevin Durant's, the Steph Curry's, because right now they're also doing it at, at an advanced age in terms of the, the longevity of the game. But to, to see him when he needs to on the defensive side of the ball still get you a stop offensively knows when he has to take over a game in year 21. I I mean, we've never seen this and I feel like that's why people are really starting to appreciate more than ever. No. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's ironic that at each milestone he hit, he hit 10 K against the Celtics, his biggest kryptonite early in his career. Yeah. He got past them. He hit 20 K against the Warriors, a team that at that point when he hit 20 K against them, did not know that it was going to be a rivalry mm-hmm. a couple years later. Beat them in the finals. Hit 30K against the Spurs. He had His biggest, battles in the finals argue. against them. Mm-hmm. 
And then the Nuggets, who, you know, they just face off in the WCF, but that kind of mean, is hey, it's all LeBron's that, way Let out. me ask you a that's question. A is, that, is that something that could be hinting at something in the future? That's having not, to overcome? Brother, y'all haven't beat them eight in games, so long. Eight games. Uh, or only. It's eight. not a rivalry. That's, uh, no, no, it's a one-way ass kick. Yeah, However, we could call it a rivalry because on our way to our chip, we smoked them in five games. That's true. They did beat the Nuggets and they won the championship. And they've taken year. it personal. Very clearly. And they something s- they don't talk about. Uh, Jokic had a better showing in that WCF than people give him credit for. He did. I think he had a better showing than what people give him credit for. I actually was doing my homework and going back to see how he played. And he had some good performances. And that Lakers team was just unfair. It was not a great matchup for them. But recently, it's been one way. And they have given it to us every time. We're losing... Losing on Saturday hurt so terribly bad because this genuinely felt like our best chance to beat them. We were coasting that entire game. We were playing some great basketball. But Darvin's inability to call a timeout is baffling. (laughs) What the fuck do you have two timeouts for in the last two minutes if you're not going to use them? What are we having Cam Reddish out on the court when he's clearly a negative on on offense? And on defense, you're not going to match him up against Jamal. I wanted Darvin gone after last uh, after that last game. Yeah, I feel like it's over for the Lakers. You know, okay, I, mean, I still don't that feel way. that way. Because <laughs> we've literally been playing our best basketball recently. What does over mean for you? I think You're over means that... Seed, by the way. Over for me means that it's like pretty clear you guys are not going to go on like a deep playoff. You, you said this last year. He's praying on it to happen again. I'm not praying no, I'm on it to happen. You're we're, hoping it happens. We're kind of better. You're still 10 seed. You're not better. We're kind of better. The Our offense year? is better, like by far, because they're performing better. The Reeves, West is better. Reeves in twenty twenty four. The West mwah. is better. It is, it is. But I still feel like playoff times, different environment, different feel. You know, out with the old and with the new. The second LeBron seed last teams. year were the Kings. I they were three. Third seed. Third seed. They were the Kings. Yeah. Memphis was second. Memphis yeah. I think the two. four teams we have now, one through four, significantly better. Than I agree, Grizzlies but I'll tell you what. I'm not going to say that I feel comfortable in the first round, but as long as we don't match up against the Nuggets, <laughs> I don't mind our chances. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, talking I think about your Minnesota man. I think that's a little disrespectful, and I think that's disrespectful because, you know, just because a team is young doesn't mean that they don't got what it takes. I agree. And Minnesota, they're not so young. They have a young star in Anthony Edwards, but really it's a team of veterans with Cat, Gobert, Mike Conley. Uh, Nas Mick- is young. Nas, Nas is, is pretty young. young so is Jaden. Yeah, McDaniel's, Edwards, Nas Reed, the core. Nikhil, the young core. You know they're kind of young, but you know they're better players. There are older veteran players. But I'm talking about OKC, of course. And uh, listen, OKC did just secure the number one seed in the NBA in the Western Conference, not the NBA. Celtics still are number one. What's the biggest reason OKC won't make a deep playoff run this season? Because maybe you feel. There's something, there's a looming question mark with this team from everything I'm reading, uh, tweets from other people. I really don't think there's an overwhelming belief or faith in this team in the postseason. And I think it's wrong. I think those people will be proven wrong. think there should be overwhelming faith? I think there should be a strong belief that this team is legitimate because from everything I'm seeing, I'm seeing this team first round exit or second round exit because people are thinking one of those guys of not nah, no more. And I could change my opinion when new evidence is provided. It took to a me. week and a half. Give or take. I could change my opinion. when new That's evidence just crazy provided to me to how me. you're saying this. And you were these people two weeks ago. I watched basketball. I changed I, I, my opinions. You, I'm just saying. Um, what's so there's, and also, uh-huh. also that's wrong because I remember on the Joel Moran show, with Mr. John Tortorelli months ago, I think it was, a month and a half ago or two months ago, somewhere around there, I had a conversation with him and I told him, I asked him a question, how many teams can legitimately beat OKC in a playoff series? Because right now I just think it's the Nuggets and I just think maybe it's the Clippers because, you know, the Nuggets, you got to respect the Nuggets and the Clippers because of their firepower. But I've always thought OKC was a real legitimate threat. Mr. Moran, you understand I'm not a fool, correct? Wait a minute. No, 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 because we asked you. Why are you saying that? Oh, Drew. Sir, do you not remember pushing that Dallas agenda and saying these are the seeds that I have it? I think OKC is going to drop to the four seed and Mavs are going to drop to the, they're going to turn to the, the fifth. I think the Mavericks, I did say that. I think the Mavericks are a dark horse team in the West. That, that, but that's not my You point. also called Phoenix a dark horse, which means you thought that they can beat They're OKC my too. Two. I wouldn't I never picked the, the Phoenix Suns to beat OKC. No, I'm saying you thought that though. But no, I but think you understand what I'm saying here. Correct? 
You know, you understand what I'm series. saying here, correct? I understand what you're right. saying, but this is my rebuttal to that. Thank you, you please. To bring up the I Joel think Moran I think show. Luka Doncic <laughs> and I think the Dallas Mavericks, when they get hot, they're going to be a scary team. Are you still expecting that? I still think they will be. Just not against OKC. 100. percent I think OKC will be a tough grinded out series. Mm-hmm. I think that that will go to the wire. I still think as OKC we curr- that. as we currently stand right now, OKC is the first seed in the West. Yeah. They're not the fourth seed. I think when we get into a team becoming a fourth seed, now we start looking at matches becoming more trickier. It's the same thing with the Clippers. The Clippers having a fourth seed He's facing off against He's weaseling his Phoenix. way out of what this do you mean? Mean? This is generational. <laughs> Dab me. Dab me, for real. I nah, don't I'm think impressed. they're going to drop. I'm impressed. I don't think they're going to drop. Nah, for real. I'm you impressed. You if I, if I, based on how they've been playing recently, they're not going to drop. We know. I'm fucking impressed. This is some shit you've never done what before. What are you talking about? No, how he's fucking no weaseling his way around. About. No, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I'm going to break it down for everyone here. Because I know that there's some smart guys that watch this. What he just tried to do was say, I, I, predict at, I predicted at the time that OKC couldn't sustain this level. That they would fall to the four. And with my projection of the Dallas Mavericks, they're going to go to the five. Yep. And if that were to come into fruition, then, hey, the Dallas Mavericks can pick them because now OKC kind of fell off. They're not that same team. But now, because he's allowed to take new evidence in, he's seen that they're the first seed in the Western they're Conference. Dogs. The clear, better conference of the two. But OKC is not just top five in offense. They're also top five in defense. SGA is a true superstar. They have an unbelievable starting rotation and some great role players off the bench. I've taken in that new evidence, and now that they're the first seed, I'm adjusting. I'm adjusting, and now the only teams that scare me with OKC are the two teams that we've been saying all along that can actually give them a run for their money, but because he's had that new evidence in two weeks, that's the, because, that's the adjustment that he's trying to make now because they're not losing the way that he thought that they would. To be fair, no, we have been saying the Clippers and the Denver with the teams that no, can beat them. No, you're, you're wrong. Number one, you're wrong because— Please, I'd love to know how I am. The only time I was low on OKC was in the beginning of the season. I had a debate with John, and we talked about the Timberwolves versus OKC, and I was lower on OKC. Uh, and then as recently, I think OKC is better. T- OKC is a better team than Minnesota. It's as simple as that. They are, and I think it's clear. It's been trending that way for a while. Agreed. OKC. I've always known Shea was his no, level of play. I know. We know that. Jalen Williams, his ascension shooting 45% from three, what he could do as a shot creator. I seen a couple weeks ago when he faced off against the Knicks and but he sir, iced the game on not, the, the math is not mathing. <laughs> it's not mathing. It was a couple of weeks ago you came here and said they're going to drop to four and lose to the Mavs in round one. That's why the math's not mathing. <laughs> yes, it is because... I told you it's gonna be a it's gonna be a dog fight. I think Luca in those matchups, he could be the difference, yes. But if they not if they don't face them in round one, you know, it doesn't they really matter. Can. But your only hope you know, of the I, Mavericks. I know, I know they still can, but this is the thing. OKC, even if they face the Clippers, I think they will beat the Clippers in a series. At this point, the only team that I'm confident that the Nuggets. could beat them in a series is the Nuggets. I'm fine with this. And it will be a tough series. I, agree. I will still give them a chance I against agree. Denver, but that's going to be the toughest series that, for them. But I understand. Every other team in the West, there's just too many question marks. Minnesota with their offense, the Clippers with their age showing Health. how Agreed. Harden cannot show up for series. Same thing with Paul George. We look at the Phoenix Suns, they don't have a point guard, their turnover problem is a real issue. Um, we look at Dallas, Jason Kidd and his coaching adjustments and decision making has gotten me worried as a recently same way how you feel about Darvin Ham. You think the mm-hmm. Lakers could reach their potential if Darvin Ham coaches a better game. I feel the same way about the Dallas Mavericks and Jason Kidd as recently hasn't been doing that. And of course, after they lose to the 76ers with no Joel Embiid and Tobias Harris ices them in the game oh, yeah. because of Jason Kidd's lack of adjustments throughout that game. Of course, it's going to make me feel more skeptical. I still believe in the Dallas Mavericks because I know in the playoff series, this I, is I've less seen about the Mavs go nuclear, and more about and I've you seen Kyrie saying that OKC go nuclear can get well. picked in round one. I don't it's think they're going to get less about but, Dallas but and more that, about that. That's my new because I don't think they'll get picked in round one. So you, you were wrong. I see. Yes. Just how you were wrong about uh, Wemby and Chad. Wait, right, you can yes. say yes. 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 You can yes. say yes. yes. I was. I was right. right. That's, that's it. That's, what we're that's for. it. But that. But I never said I was right. Or I never said I was right though. That's that's what y'all missing. You were you were you were trying to make me say I was wrong. I never said I was right. No, we're trying to, to get you to take accountability. 
take accountability for what? For watching new evidence and then forming my Joel, opinion? they've been a top three seed they've all year. They've been amazing all year. They've been year. a top 10 defense and a top 10 offense all year. This is not new. It was just J-Dub a couple. has been great. The only, all, this like, is not bro, something new. If you made this statement in December, Th- there's a di- this there, is the difference. It's different than making it two weeks ago. They, this they've is been the this great all year, This is the bro. difference. Of course they've been this great all year, but the difference is that the West was all still figuring itself out. That's the difference. I don't know about that. In the beginning of the year, you can't say for real. You can't go and uncover the blinds and say this team is this, 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 and that. Their weaknesses are this, 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 and that. Early in the season, Minnesota was one of the best fourth quarter offenses in the NBA. You couldn't pick apart their fourth quarter clutch offense early in the year because they're playing at an elite level. But now that we're close to the playoffs, every team's weaknesses are becoming magnified. But how long has Minnesota's offense been poor? For months now, correct? Not months. I would say a month and a half around okay. there. But so not the, months, a month and a half. But but how? months is it could be two, it could be three. I mean, okay. but that's, you, that's you said a, a month and a half, but months is but two. Here, here's but here, my, my thing, point Drew. being is you did this two weeks ago, Drew. Here's what my in thing. Two weeks has made you change from could lose in the first round to hey, this they is a finals, finals team. Because if they would face the Dallas Mavericks in the first round, that's what y'all not getting. I think the Dallas Mavericks, if Luka is nuclear and Kyrie goes nuclear, yes, they could beat teams. Bro, they can still play them, though. You know, you, you, I know they can still play yeah, them. So this, is, I, this is still a possibility. Yeah, but it, and if they would match up, I think that's a close series. That's a grinded so out series. You, do you still think Dallas could beat them or no? I think they can beat them, yes. So you still believe that? Yes. I okay. never said right, they right. can't beat them. I think I think Dallas can still beat them. They can still give them As a the run one for the seed, money. OKC... You can see them losing to the eight Dallas Mavericks. Well, he's telling me if they fall, it'll be a four or no, five. They're, they're no, like, no, 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 no. If you look at the standings, yes. Dallas can very well eight. still play. You know the what? One that doesn't matter because right. the it, seating it really doesn't matter. It should. It's matter. just about they'll the be, they'll be in the road regardless. Yes, they'll still they'll still have a chance. You're telling me they wouldn't have a chance? I don't see. Here's the thing. I'm not going to sit here and talk about the chances. What do you believe? Do you believe that Dallas will win? Like, who's the favorite to win? You take OKC. You don't think OKC is the favorite, but I think. Because when you make your prediction, you're going to sit down you and think, say, hold up, mm, I'm going to go Dallas in seven. I'm going to say, hold okay, up. hear you. I'm going to go OKC. If they play, you got OKC in five? I have OKC winning that series relatively comfortably. Like in five. See, that's what he believes. Five, he, six games. Yeah, that's what he you think it's OKC in I think in OKC five? in six. In six. And I'm a, I think oh, as of today, and that's not going to change. I think OKC in six. Well, for me, I'm not going to be like, it could be a chance. I'm not doing that. Well, for OKC. me, I think it's a seven game series. Because I've seen Luka well, Dodgers. winning? I think seven game series can go either way. I've seen Luka Doncic in great series. Though. I also see him losing five against Golden State. Correct. That's it. But it's happened. The, the, the NBA champion against Golden State. That's really you just told that me that, that OKC is a finals team. They can make the finals, yes. But right now, you look at Vegas odds. I think they're they're six to win an NBA championship. And I think they're taking into to account their age. Mm-hmm. It's different against the Warriors. I mean, I've seen Luka with Porzingis only playing three games take. A Clippers, Clippers team with sure. Kawhi and Paul George both at their peak so athletic prime have won more games to seven the Warriors. games. You can argue that, yes. Yeah. But he still played very great against the Warriors, and it was clear that the team around him wasn't holding up their end of the bargain. He, he did. He did. But The second time around when they faced the Clippers, Luka took them to seven, and it, Kawhi was at the peak of his powers. He had Shaq-like efficiency in that series. I mean, I've seen Luka take teams that he's not supposed to take to seven to seven games. So for me to say that he can't take OKC to seven when he has a sidekick in Kyrie Irving, I think that would be disingenuous. And to me, I'm not going to do that. If it's a seven game series, it can go either way. Seven games means that these teams for six games in a series matched each other out. And the seventh game is, is win or go home is all or nothing for that game. That's why single game and There's elimination games. Seven games. There's certain game sevens where I don't have a doubt in my you, mind. You want to know what's crazy? And if they get that game seven happens, you're at a crossroads because now you're kind of torn between one or the other. No, because if Lucas him, it should no, be Dallas. But, but that's why I say he's kind of torn between one or the other. I mean, Luca can still play well. The last lose. two basketball episodes that we've had, it's been you two going at it about SGA. I mean, Luca. And played. if let's say SGA falls short in a game seven, now you're caught in a crossroads. Dallas would play OKC as a team. Right now, because they are eight, yes. I mean, to me, that doesn't really matter if I'm caught at a crossroads or not. It's going to be a great basketball product, and whoever wins deserves to win. That's it. You know, <laughs> if, if the Dallas Mavericks what win, if the, if the Dallas Mavericks win, they go on, and that's fine. That's a great win for them. If OKC wins, they prove themselves. <laughs> really, 
I'm not at odds either way. Why would I be at odds? Let me ask you a question. You're saying that game seven, you're taking Luka to win? I'll take Steph over anybody. You'll take Steph over anybody? The game it's seven, tough. I'm taking Steph. Yeah, but Except against LeBron. I still would take Steph. I mean, we've seen it live. Yeah. We've seen it live. It happened. No, I'm just saying, I would still take Steph. That's, That's why I'm asking, like, are you taking Luka, who's this guy, or are you taking us? Yeah. Well, listen, I think the... Because if he loses in round one, our what's the conversation? Our disconnect I don't think here. that's a terrible thing to do. I would be disappointed if OKC lost in round one. Here's the thing. Wouldn't um, you? They play the Suns. First seed? It depends on who they match up. You know, that's the thing. They can match up with the Suns of Dallas. But the thing is, the advanced numbers also back up. Like, we can watch OKC and understand this is a genuinely them, great team. You gotta throw them out the window when the playoffs start. That's so tough because they're a top five defense, which to me is what matters them a lot. Didn't the you, fact that their defense don't you tell can us translate. All the time your Lakers completely voided all of that and the I'm, Heat. I understand what you're saying. Fair point. But on both sides of the ball, to be this they great, should, they should get out the first. The round. only deficit of them to me, which is what I was going to answer to this question, would be their rebounding. They're not that great of a rebounding team. And the youth thing, to me, I feel like they have the talent. They're a talented enough team to still overcome that. It's the fact that they do lack the size. That could be their one area where people may not see them as the favorite to make the final, which is why I feel like the Nuggets would beat them in a series. But outside of that, the fact that they are a top-five half-court offense and a top-five mm. half-court defense, shout-out to the NBA University, that translates to NBA playoff basketball. Of course it does. Uh the situation in the playoffs is going to be different. Mm -hmm. I think they'll be ready for it. Um, here's something I wanted to talk to you about, Riv. I wanted to uh, pose you this question. What up, what up, what up, what up? Um, because back to the seven-game thing, yeah, yeah. ultimately, I do think that in seven-game series, it goes either way. You might have a favorite in it, but that doesn't mean it, it's not unpredictable no, because the so. nature of game sevens are historically – unpredictable two years ago when we got the Celtics and the Miami Heat game seven the Celtics went on to win that and the face Golden State mm. Jimmy Butler had a chance when he took that transition three when people wanted him to go to the basket he should have went to, the to make that shot I was fine with it if he took if he made that shot we're talking about the Miami Heat going to the NBA finals mm -hmm. that moment in itself is unpredictable last year the Heat go up 3-0 the Celtics come back, and they win three straight. And in Game 7, Miami wins. Now, I understand Tatum rolled his ankle, but Game 7s, by nature, are very unpredictable. But there's also Game 7s where, like Steph, last year, playing against the Kings, 50 points. There's Game 7s with Jason Tatum, 50 points. LeBron James, Game 7 against uh, Boston on the mm -hmm. road. Yep, for like, there's times where the man. best player in the series is, can do that for a single game. There's no doubt. And Luca compared to SJ in terms of playoffs, obviously because SJ hasn't yeah. been there. It's a it's a grand size ca uh, we, canyon. So we've seen Luca do it against the Suns in Game Seven, where yeah. the Suns had an issue in a pile. Like he's done it. Fans. It's not like he hasn't done it. I know Luca has done it, <laughs> but what I'm what I'm That's saying is four cuts to lead the forty. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is this though. What I'm saying is that I think Luca can have a great game. And they can still lose. I mean, of course. Because I just saw Boston oh, yeah. smoke them, and Luka had a 30, near 40 point triple, triple double. double. Yep. I seen That's games Boston, this though. year where Luka. But it happened against Philly. It literally happened against Philly. He did I, it again. Yeah. I seen Luka go for 70 and barely get past the, the Atlanta Hawks. Hawks. Yeah. So all year long, I've seen Luka have that just great means performances. They're not a good team. That's and really what it comes win. down to. They're not a good team. Let me not say they're not that good. They're not, they're not this team that's going to make a run. Just call it what it is. It's not it's Luka's not fault. Maybe on the defensive side, maybe we could point to that. But offensively, there is almost nobody in the world who can do what he can do. It's not you, his fault. You need Kyrie to show up. Ky Kyrie has been inconsistent. I agree, but this defense really has just been bad. This defense will get better when Jason Kidd plays more big man in the Hopefully. lineup. And for me... I think that, of course, Luca elevates this roster. For sure. This, this, That's with, without we Luca, this team is we, a, is we a lottery We all know team. you know that. I understand they that. They be a lottery team. Damn. That is low-key the truth. I don't think they'll be that. They will make the playoffs. Okay, I'm fine with I'm that. Not, no, listen. But, 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 but he's saying, just like how you like to play chance. Correct. There is a chance yes. that they can still be a lottery I'll team. I'll be honest. That gave me goosebumps. That's sad. It's a fact. 
It's, it's not gonna happen. That's I, no, sad. You believe it's not gonna happen. I it's get not it. Gonna happen. But you're now you're being a bit of a hypocrite because you just said before Lakers are done, there, right? Lakers are done. There's Even a though, chance in Game yes, Seven and this, yes, that, and third. So, you, and technically, there is a chance that the Dallas Mavericks yes. can still miss the playoffs. They're an eighth seed. They will be a playing team. Listen, there's a chance they can still miss the playoffs. There's a chance. That's all I'm there's saying. a chance two weeks from now they go on a win streak and they're the That's 16th. what you're begging for. You're, <laughs> you're pleading for it. I, I do. I do have a bet with Drew. I do have a bet with Drew. You're still waiting on the, please, the, the I am begging for it. I, I do agree with you. But if I win that bet, also I'll say this: we can just cut it even. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I know. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we can get back. I was under the assumption that you was waiting for this bet. Most definitely. To you know, reveal. Then I also have a bet with Riv that it's not looking good. You, me, and you. What's up? <laughs> Nets are cooked, bro. What is, we'll call it a day, bro. Yeah, the Nets are cooked. Listen, but when it comes to OKC, I put out a poll. First round exit, second half. I saw second this. round exit. You saw that Chet destroyed single in that poll? Oh, I know. Okay. Well, you didn't, you didn't talk about that one. <laughs> didn't, didn't talk. Chet, Chet is more of a PR darling. <laughs> no, he didn't say anything. He He's destroyed a, single. Uh, you're cooking. Cooking, he is a, a PR darling. Yeah, that's good, that's Sh- nobody point. really knows about Shangun. That's a good point. You got to know ball to understand that Shangun's OD. Got to know the poll. The, the split no, was crazy, was, bro. Because no, you know, <laughs> ball knowers show out. They show out if they really want to. They didn't. The, yeah, no, they didn't. The gap was yeah. nuts. It, it was unfortunate, but still, it doesn't remove the fact. It was that, like uh, almost seventy thirty. It was bad. I know Riff still got a lot of Cade stock, but Shangun, as of right now, you could say is the best player in that class. Yes. He also has the, you know. It's pretty impressive, you ask me. I mean, Kate's situation is in the mud, so we'll figure Rocket's it out. Rocket's situation was in the mud. Nah, this year's been fine. It has been. Getting yeah. Emei saved their legacy. A big yeah. part of that was Shangun's growth. Monty was supposed like to be an all-star. But we all knew that wasn't the case, sadly. No, we didn't. Monty was, he was supposed to definitely booty bring some in, stability. In, in, with the Suns. He wasn't booty. He got outcoached by Bud. Yeah, but they won 60 games. He, he was loved, good. Yeah, but then they he was got supposed to be better than what he is now. Fair. Yeah, he definitely no, no, most definitely. Most he, definitely. He's like most arguably definitely. one of the worst coaches in the league yeah, right I now. agree wholeheartedly. When it comes to OKC, I just feel like there's a lot of disrespect. Uh, Were you mad at them saying that they could lose in the second round? No, I'm not mad at it, but I, I'm kind of upset at the fact that 70 to 80 percent of the, the votes are first, second round. I don't think there's a lot of belief in this team making a deep playoff run, but I think OKC can make a deep playoff run. I agree. Uh Similar to how I felt about Minnesota early in the season, I got to see the offense pick up still. Um, the only two things that can stop them is Josh Giddy and how he's going to look in the playoffs because he's borderline unplayable. They're just leaving him open out there. It's sad. And oh. then it's a, uh, oh, oh, yeah, you know. No, Mega L. James Buck Knight. Ouch. I'm going to stay out of this one because I have the worst one of them all. You were a Jalen Green fan. Still better than James Buck Knight. I'm sorry, bro. No, yeah, but he sucks too. Still. James Buck Knight is gotta, out the dump. league. LLL. We're here. Listen, my big prospect's Taylor Hendricks. We're still waiting on that. My guy in that draft was Herb Jones and Trey Murphy. I don't, bang, I, bang. I, I remember Herb Jones. I don't remember Herb Jones being. No, I remember Herb no, Jones. No, that was my guy. He texted oh, me about it? Herb oh, Jones okay. a while That's before. Yeah. That doesn't give I actually you a, have an old oh, DM oh, message. Bro, that doesn't give you a W. Why not? Why? Because I didn't. it's not like I disagreed with you. W, you only get a W uh, if we have a different opinion. Uh-huh. That's why Giddy that. is a W for me. Buck Knight's a W for you, but Green is a W for me. He's ass. He's ass. <laughs> Cam Thomas is a W for me. Ah, we're, wait and see. That's, that's a wait and see thing. That's a wait and see. I'm trying to insert myself into this conversation. I really can't because that was at a time where I didn't take prospects serious. I feel like last year was the first year I really did the deep dive on prospects. So, Luke yeah. Luke Grubo's L. Yeah, that was that one for sure. But yeah, I'm thinking about this year. It was Case and Wallace, it was Taylor Hendricks. One for two right now. Jordan Hawkins was your And guy. Jordan Hawkins, for sure. And Jordan Hawkins can let that thing cook. No, nah, he's great. He's a great shooter. Um, I think OKC can make a deep playoff run. Okay. Like, the two things about them that scare me, Josh Giddy, but I feel like having Isaiah Joe take his minutes with Case and Wallace and Gordon Hayward, maybe he finds himself because as of recently, he really hasn't looked good at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll be able to play guys in those spots in the playoffs that will help them. And um, the rebounding, 27th in rebounding, but... They're 13th in defensive rebounding, mm. which I think is a pretty promising number. They're 29th in offensive rebounding, so they're not getting many second-chance points, but this offense has been so efficient. They really don't need many second-chance points. Fair it's enough. more of a luxury for them. Josh Giddy, career low, 24 minutes per game. On the court, they have a plus 5.2 difference, 119 offensive rating, 114 defensive rating. But off the court, they have a plus 12 difference, 122.7 offensive rating, 110.7 defensive rating. 
his on-court numbers are very diluted because SGA is usually on the court with him. Mm -hmm. But when you filter SGA being off the court and Giddy being on, it's a minus 4.3 difference, 112 offensive rating, 116.9 defensive rating. So Josh Giddy, if he's not on the court with SGA, who takes a lot of pressure off of him, uh, they are terrible. And You're no longer a Gideon? No, I'm no longer a Gideon. After what he did, I'm no longer it. And then his play this year, he lost me completely. Uh, <laughs> and even even with his play, he still lost me after, yeah. after you know, this stuff oh, no, most definitely. came out. But off the court, they're a much better team. And I think Mark Dagno will make the adjustment to not playing much. He's already playing a career low in, in minutes per game this year. And I feel like progressively throughout this season, he's playing him less and less. I just want to really attack the argument that this team is too young. Yeah. To make a deep playoff run or maybe win the championship. Winning a championship, probably, it might be a little bit of a stretch just because Boston has been so dominant. And you, you still got to get past Denver, who they are the defending champions. But this is a team that forces the most turnovers in the NBA. J Dub is leading their team in fourth quarter scoring. He's another jumbo four creator playmaker yep. that can take the reins of the offense when SGA is off the court. And you look at matchups they have. Against the Timberwolves, even though Minnesota might have a size advantage, Rudy Gobert was scrambling when he was trying to guard Chet when they matched up as of recently. With the Clippers, they put Zubots in these pick-and-roll actions, and they really pick him apart when he tries to go into drop. The Nuggets last year, one of the youngest teams to win a championship, average age of 27.5. The Warriors in 2015, another young team to win a championship, average age of 27. You got to go back all the way to 1977 to find a team as young as OKC. That was the Portland Trailblazers with Bill Walton as MVP. They had an average age of 24.7 years old. Youngest team ever to win a chip. OKC is even younger than that. But a team in recent history to make a deep run was the 2011 OKC Thunder with an average age of 24.2, younger than this OKC team. And you look at that run... You know, had it not been for LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh all in their prompts, 2011-2012 uh, season. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had it not been for all of them in their prime, they probably win a championship. And after game one, it was looking like they, they had a real legitimate they chance. They did. But then mm -hmm. they just got they just got smoked out after that. And Brown Russell Westbrook didn't have a good series. Maybe I'm crazy. I think this current version of OKC is better than that OKC Big 3. I, I know that people think that's a hot take, but... We have to look at the time of that. <laughs> I'm laughing at Of, of that big know. three. Kevin Durant, MVP. We all know all of them became future MVP players, right? James Harden was still a six man. I think if we're doing a poll on who are the best players, it's KD and SGA. I think they cancel each other out. Um, you think that's crazy? KD and SGA cancel each other out at that point just in time, continue, 2011, continue. 2012? Just continue. Didn't I think Russell Westbrook clearly the next guy up. Yes. Dennis Chet, Dennis J-Dub, Dennis Harden. He was sixth man of the year, though. It's not like he was an average sixth man of the year. No, he wasn't, but he was averaging 16 points per game. Um, I think James Harden was great and in was his role. Duty in but the finals. I look at J Dub and what he's producing, Chet Holmgren, what he's produ producing both offensively and defensively. Sure. I do think if we're looking back and comparing these six players at their current Harden's state, the worst of Harden the is the worst, and it, that's not a slight. Mm -hmm. I think J Dub right now is probably better than that version of Harden. That six man of the year. J Dub is amazing. He is amazing. And I think Chet too, because of his two way impact. This is a team that's top five in offense and defense. They have the best net rating against top 10 teams in the NBA. Mm -hmm. I think they can make a legitimate run uh, in the playoffs. I know the West is a gauntlet, but the West was a gauntlet back then when OKC made that run, and they proved themselves. This is a team that beat the Lakers yep. six games, five games, mm -hmm. and then beat the San Antonio Spurs in six games. Whew, that's that's a that's a mountain to climb. The Spurs who the following year after that. And the year after that well, went to the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a OD. mountain to climb. That's just, all right, all right. And Harden had a uh defined performance Ooh. against the Spurs. Yeah, I he, think he had 40 in one of those games. I think yeah, game five that's or a six. Mountain one to of climb. Those. But uh maybe you can argue that Harden in a different role probably would average more points. Well, the year after year. he was unbelievable. Yeah, of course. Rockets. He was an all-star stamped. Uh, but just that current version of Harden, they had Tabo starting over him because of defensive purposes. I, I just think, I don't think this big three is per se just like 
way better than them um, or even better. I think it's just similar. I think they're similar because I do think that KD and this SGA, they do cancel each other out. Can I ask you guys a question? What's more impressive, drafting Steph, Clay, and Dre or drafting KD, Russ, and Harden? The team that won championships. No, it's KD, Russ, and Harden. Because if Harden stayed with them, they would have won a championship. No, it's not. If you have to add a See, if, wow, Riv, not. you're shocking me right now. If you have to add a, it, it's the team that drafted. As I'm asking the question, I'm just like, wow, I just asked what's more impressive, drafting three MVPs or essentially drafting the core of a dynasty. You drafted, the dynasty is more important. Maybe you can say that yeah. because and, that's and what Harden they became. wasn't an MVP with, oh, you didn't draft an MVP. But the potential was always there. But you, you you have to talk about what you gain from the player. You can't say like Russ oh. couldn't have been an MVP if KD didn't leave. Yeah, but he was there, so I give you that. But you can't say I drafted Harden and he was an MVP, but he was MVP down the road in Houston. Mm -hmm. I they feel like you're became, ignoring that OKC is one of the biggest what ifs in NBA history. Well, that doesn't bold well in the conversation of the it, debate about it that does. is that is the question in terms. Of, well, I I'm more on Joel's side. I still think OKC. You drafted three MVPs. I can't. I can't say that though, because they didn't. They did win. Well, they did. No, they didn't. They, they did. did draft. They didn't him. draft three MVPs. They drafted two MVPs. Don't do that. They drafted they all drafted three, three of MVPs. Them. Okay. Well, the Golden State Warriors drafted four-time champions. You cooked. <laughs> A unanimous MVP. But two of them were because, ironically, one of those MVPs that's in the conversation that we're so, talking about. But if you're going to add that, yes. then I can say James Harden didn't win the MVP well, Houston. Here's the thing. OKC, that OKC Big 3 is one of the biggest what-ifs in NBA history. And yes, with yeah. the benefit of hindsight, you say that Golden State, what they drafted was more impressive because it was a nucleus of a dynasty. But ultimately, with OKC... Mm -hmm. They were 24 years old when they made a finals run. Like you mentioned, being the Lakers, being the Spurs. Uh, who else did they beat in, in that playoff run? Dallas. They beat the Dallas Mavericks, who were the defending champions at the time. And James Harden, it was his first real breakout season yeah, yeah. where he won six man of the year. He was only 22 years old. I think he might have been 21, 22 years old. After that season, OKC didn't want to pay him money. No, I agree. And then they traded fucked him. up. They, they messed up. So we're saying at an average age of 24 years old, yeah. not even with them, their big three at their best together, yeah. they made a finals run. You're telling me they're better because of a what if. I'm no, only telling not, you they're better because not saying, the three players are better. We're not saying that's better. Not, that's you not said what more impressive. Yes. You but said it, more yes, impressive. That is what I ask. Wait, which one is more impressive? Yes. Oh, then it's easy. The team that actually has done it multiple times. <laughs> What the hell are we doing? No, because I think I think OKC. <laughs> what did what outside of the finals, which was impressive? I'm not disputing that. What else was impressive? You can't name anything else because they were broken. 73 up games at that point. is impressive. Winning a ring before that was impressive, of nonetheless. Steph being a unanimous MVP and being one of the greatest point guards in a five year stretch is impressive. Draymond Green becoming one of the best defenders ever. Was it three is DPO in, wise, right? No, he just won one. He was supposed to win. Apologize. Yeah, that's impressive. Else, obviously. The what ifs are cool, but they're, they're, it's no, it's no like that. That's just what ifs. That it could have happened. The what if is based on the idea of drafting these three players, comparing. Sam Presti drafting these guys versus, I think at the time, Bob Myers yeah. and then Jerry West, Somebody whatever. Else, yeah. You know, all those guys drafting the big three of the Warriors. What's more impressive? And I think what's more impressive is drafting the three future first ballot MVP Whoa. type players. Because, yes, it's a what if, but it's a what if based on it got broken up. Is James they made Harden, the finals. Is James Harden a uh, first ballot MVP because of what he did in OKC? No, right? No, his he's a first, he's a first battle MVP of what he did in Houston. Hall right? of Famer, you're saying? Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. Hall of Famer. Uh -huh. Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and Dre are all probably going to be how, how, uh, for, probably not maybe not Clay being first, but they're all going to be Hall of Famers. Yeah, but my thing is that OKC wasn't able to grow. But I think Harden you have and to OKC put that into would have still became an All Star level player. He might have not won MVP with those guys, for sure, for but sure. he would have been an All Star, All NBA level player. And I think OKC would have won a championship with that big I, three. I, listen, I think so too, but we can't go off the what if. If we're not saying, like, for example, we're not saying, uh, you know, we're like, say, say, for example, the Miami Heat 
big three, right? LeBron, Bosh, and Wade. You wouldn't say they're better than the Spurs' big three because of what ifs and what they could have done. No, you go off what they've done. And what they've done is the Warriors' big three has racked off more accomplishments and more championships together. But it's two different conversations. Your conversation is... What was better? What was more impressive in terms of no, what, what did these three guys accomplish? No, no, what the, We're what talking they did about was more impressive. this in terms of the GM job. Was it more impressive drafting these three future MVPs or these three players that were nucleus to a championship? I mean, what's all right? So let me put it this way: maybe it might be better. What's more impressive, the three MVP caliber players possibly winning, or the one kid who wasn't even supposed to be the best guard in the league, Draymond Green, a second round pick, and Klay Thompson winning four? What's more impressive now? I if think you think about you, it like that. But you you drafting those players and then becoming what they became. It's is crazy. Westbrook no, was a top 10 pick. No. Harden yep. was top a three. lottery pick. He was the third pick. Kevin Durant was the number one pick in the second, draft. No, pardon me. Number draft. two pick in the draft. Steph was a top 10 pick. Draymond Seven. second. Clay, I think, was lottery. But he was a first round pick. If we're, if we're doing it like that, what's really more impressive? But then we look at the factors that all right. account to uh, all those different things. kind of fraud. No, I understand what he's saying. But then it's, it's a good argument then right it's, there. It is a good argument. But then you look at the other factors. What's the other factors? The other factors are that Mark Jackson, yes. he helped develop Steph Curry uh-huh, uh-huh. and Klay Thompson. Then Steph, Steve Kerr came developed in and he put in the system for that team. That team was a young team on the rise, but they made moves around mm-hmm, them mm-hmm. to be better. Getting an all-star in Andre Iguodala from Denver. Yes, 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 it yes. put them over the top to where he accepted a six-man role, mm-hmm. and now they had the best six-man, an all-star coming off the bench for them. Mm-hmm. Then that dynasty, because if we're all in agreement that a dynasty is three championships or more, that dynasty acquired Kevin Durant. Without Kevin Durant, we're sitting at two championships. You can still argue those two championships is more impressive as an oh, accomplishment. It's not even, yeah. yeah, of course, and what they accomplished in OKC, but we cannot ignore that they added Kevin Durant yes, yes, yes. to become a dynasty. So can we talk about how the GM literally allowed the GM Harden to walk out the building? If we're going to add the context, we can add that too. He he let that big three. He picked the wrong guy in the big three. He picked Serge Ibaka over James Harden. He yes. did that. So can we not add that in context if we're adding Kevin Durant and all this good stuff? I think the conversation is just what was more impressive in terms of the GM drafting. Well, I think That's what it. what the GM in Golden State did was more impressive, personally. Like, Draymond Green was a second-round pick. It's not a surprise Westbrook turned into a great player. Ibaka was a late first. They what also the, drafted wait, what, Ibaka. Why are we adding Ibaka? Because we're talking about guys they drafted. Right? I only was talking about the top three. I know, but like... Oh, they, so that's the one you want to do. I'm just okay. saying, Ibaka was the late first. <laughs> oh my, all right, that's You going to mention Festus Azili? No, I wasn't. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was going to mention Kevon Looney. That's a banger. That's solid. That's not Ibaka, though. Ibaka was no. out in three blocks a game. But at the same time, Kevon Looney is an NBA champion. Multiple. So, so is Ibaka. He did finesse, but not on OKC. It's a lot of on the stuff, Raptors. Here's the thing. A lot of the stuff that the big three did outside of Westbrook... Was not in OKC. Yeah, it it literally taints that whole thing. Kevin Durant became a champion. And after if you think OKC. about it, if he never went to Golden State, shit, the three of them may not have championships. Literally, I just think the fact that the three of them are just objectively the better talent. Yeah, I get outside that. of of course Steph Curry. No, I that's why that. I lean OKC. That's kind of why if I. If you say went to talent impressive. perspective, I wouldn't. That's be That's solely you. what I'm doing. Yeah. But when you break it down in the sense of Steph was. Not a top five pick. He was number seven. He was or almost six or league. one of the two. Uh, number seven. You, the fact that Draymond was a second round pick. Clay was the eleventh pick. And Clay was mm-hmm. not a top ten pick either. And the three of them became the foundation for one of the greatest dynasties this game's ever seen. That is impressive. But off talent alone, they Kevin Durant, it. top twelve player of all time. They Russell Westbrook and James you, Harden you beat me are there. MVPs. You beat me there. I mean, uh, nothing I can say about that. Yeah, the the argument for the potential and where they were drafted, I think it it makes sense to an extent. You cooked, but um, with the Warriors and when they drafted Steph, I mean Johnny Flynn was the pick above him, and Rubio got selected above him. Yep. I mean, those could be viewed as whiffs from other GMs, right? But I, I still think Steph, being a top ten pick, was supposed to be a great player. Clay Thompson was supposed to be not a good NBA player. Remember when he had not the, the best player in remember the world. Remember when he had the leg with uh, the ankle injuries yeah, for and stuff sure. like that. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But for me, I come, I'll come. This how I break it down is the fact that if I'm just evaluating what you drafted as a GM, if I'm looking at a GM that drafted KD, Harden, and Westbrook, and, I, and I'm looking at a GM that drafted Steph, Clay, and Draymond, I would think drafting. 
KD, Harden, yes. and Westbrook is more impressive. If, yeah, you just because the, they were the better prospects. They were the better players. And for me, I think that when it when we get into the accomplishment argument, Golden State is going to wipe ninety nine percent of teams in NBA history or trios in NBA history. But we have to take into account that the first year that this team clicked, they went to the finals and they went through a gauntlet in the West and they just lost to LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. You know, so I I feel like if you had given that more time, we might not be talking about Golden State as a dynasty. That could have been a team that stopped Golden State from being a dynasty. I agree. You know, because when Golden State in 2016 faced OKC, you know, they were up 3-1. Um, OKC was up 3-1. Mm-hmm. Golden State came back. If they have James Harden in that series, do I think that comeback happens? I don't know. So, for me, it's like we're really comparing one year of young big three OKC to, you know, how many years has it been where Golden State has been together? Like 10? Since Draymond has started. I think he started in 14. So, I think when they played... No, it might have been it might have been the first year Steve Kerr got there. I think that's when he yeah. started to start because so, David Lee was there. Yeah, so we're talking about like an eight year sample size. So that's why I I think it's that unfair, it's more impressive. It's an unfair conversation. But then I understand your point because you know you're drafting the prospects that were not drafted as high. Yeah. You know, like if you're OKC and you have the second overall pick, how do you miss on that? You know, like you how do you one. how do you miss on Harden? How do you well, miss Craig on Oden. Russ? Well, in hindsight, now you could say no, of Portland, you whiffed. But yeah. Greg Oden was supposed to be the pick. I understand, but I'm saying like now, hindsight, we have hindsight mm-hmm. to think about it now. It's like, uh, Kevin Durant was kind of sitting right there. You kind of whiffed on it. But it was know. just the injury with Greg Oden. It's just unfortunate. But um, yeah, like, you know, with OKC's picks, it's like there's, if you mess up the pick, that's more reflection on you. Where Golden State getting their picks right is more so a credit to them for drafting the right players in those like respective definitely. spots. Yeah. Even though, and I think uh, the, the year that Clay was drafted, Kawhi was the 15th pick. He was. Was he? Yeah. Well, I know Kawhi was 15. Yeah. To the Pacers. He I think, uh, he, didn't get, he got traded, right? I think that was the 2011 NBA he, draft. Indiana picked him and then traded him for George Hill. Yeah. So Clay Thompson was the 11th pick. Kawhi was 15th. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, I still, still, I mean, I still a great pick. I'm looking Clay. at that 2014 run from the Spurs. Generation. Why was Tim Duncan still elite? He won. Yeah. He made all defensive team like 30, every year. Yeah. Every year. It was old. But Bro. back to this conversation God, about damn. like young OKC, uh, this current version of OKC. So OKC's current big three versus OKC's big three. We're talking about SGA, J Dub, Chet versus KD, Westbrook, and Harden. Who's better? Damn. Without using hindsight, what you knew after and what what you knew like. Russ became an MVP. Harden became MVP because we knew KD was an MVP type player. I but think we know that about Russ and Harden. These for me, three players. Oh, well, oh, good guy. Go I think crazy. for me, it depends on who's going to reach that Westbrook level. Because at the time, you know, he was an all star, 24 point per game score. You know, just to, at, at the time, he, that was when he was playing defense. You know, he was a rim runner. Uh, he was great at the basket. So it's really just who's going to reach that level. But at the same time, it's such a different game now. Like, mm-hmm. J Dub's ability to get to all three levels at a high rate is impressive. Shet's ability to stretch the floor and be a rim protector. It's just such a different game now where you didn't need to be a super efficient shooter back in that time to be effective. You know, Westbrook could just be effective the way he is. Ah, uh, I would probably ah oh, fuck. It's tough. This might be gross of me to say. If the three of them matched up against one another, I'm taking this new version of, of, of OKC. The way that you match up, Chad and KD, KD's still going to get his. You don't think about it. Uh, But SGA and J-Dub are great defenders in their own right. And Russell uh, Russell Westbrook, of course, is one of the more athletic guards that this game's seen. But, of course, SGA's been running for Defensive Player of the Year. He won't win it. But it's speaking to the testament of how elite of a defender he is. He has a chance to make an All-NBA defensive team on top of being first-team All-NBA. And then J-Dub, you mentioned the shooting. We understand how good he is as a defender on top of it, too. Harden never was that level defender. Can get his offensively, no doubt about it. But the fact that Chet has the ability to at least put size against Kevin Durant, which not many competitors do have, I just look at... Comparing the big three, looking at this big three now, they have all bases of the game covered. On the defensive side of the ball, SGA is one of the best two-way players in the game. Uh, you can look at J-Dub being one of the best two-way players for, for I guess, a role player. He's an advanced-level role player. And then Chet Holmgren being the shot, the, the rim protector that he is, having the ability to stretch the floor. They're so well-rounded in their trio as compared to 
the KD, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden, where their strength is relatively sim- similar. It's scoring. I do think that SGA and J-Dub will have an easier time guarding Westbrook and Harden versus Harden and Westbrook guarding SGA and J-Dub. I don't know, maybe. It was, this was bully ball Westbrook. I was going to say, no slight to Westbrook. He's yeah. obviously a solid defender. It's just with Russell Westbrook, I think the shooting was just always a concern mm-hmm. and the the proneness to turn over the ball. Yep. I think that's what really messed up in the fi- messed him up in the finals. In the finals, I think Russell Westbrook, I mean, he was a turnover machine. Mm-hmm. He was terrible at taking care of the ball. Uh, I think really what makes this matchup is like the Kevin Durant matchup. I think Kevin Durant, for as efficient of a shooter he is all time, his first step when he was young was super fast. Oh, yeah. And he was somebody that could get to the basket at will, can finish efficiently, and then you have to worry about everything else around yeah, his I'll game. I'll be honest, he could legitimately score 12 straight against Shaq. And I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. There's no stopping Kevin Durant. There's literally nobody in NBA history, really, that could stop Kevin Durant, except himself. When it comes to this OKC team, this current version, this current iteration, how far do you think they're going to go? And what do you think is the biggest weakness? I think re- I can see them... Like the way they're so all right, so I'm gonna do it by like how the standing is today. Obviously, it's it could change, it will change, you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks. So right now, it's a one eight four five three six two seven type of thing. Mm-hmm. So one eight, they play Dallas. I do think they'll beat Dallas, and then four five is the Clippers and the Pelicans. I do think the Clippers will beat them in that series in a six seven game series. So I think for me, as of today, I would say the farthest they can get is the second round. But I think you know that's a series where like. I trust in Kawhi. You know, I think, you know, the defense for the Clippers have been concerning, but I've seen Ty Lue adjust. I've seen him be, True. you know, an adjustment machine in the playoffs. I've seen them kick it up on defense. So I just, like, with the Thunder, it's not just an experience thing. It's a what What do you – what? Can, how do you manage in a playoff setting? How do you manage in a playoff series? What's your go-to sets? What's your go-to plays? How do you adjust in the two under two minutes, under four minutes? How do you adjust when the game gets slower, the game – like, it's just a different energy in the playoffs. And we don't have any evidence of the Thunder doing that. You know, not not because, you know, they just – they're really young. But with the Clippers, I've seen, you know, Ty Lue in situations – Bench his big men all series. Go with a six eight guy at the five. I've seen him bench Pat Bev, a great defender at the time, and go just straight wings. Like I've seen him. Excuse me. That's why I don't want a fucking sprite. I've seen him <laughs> make uh, make the you know so, like the make the insane adjustments to win him series. I've seen him go down two zero and just undoubtedly rack off wins. You know, so for me, I think the Thunder and you know Bismack Biombo was a cool pickup. Mascalo was whatever, but I think like this team, like Nurkic had thirty rebounds last night, like you know, and it wasn't no like you know that's that's gonna be an issue. I think their rebounding is a concern. I think experience in the sense of you know how just how to just deal with the atmosphere that is playoff basketball is is gonna matter. But um, I do think they're 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 gonna get to the second round. I think that for me, playoff started today. I think they could beat the Suns or the Mavericks personally, or the Warriors or the Kings, honestly, or the Pelicans. So. I think they're a second round team regardless what right about now. The Lakers. Didn't acknowledge you guys, but yes, I think they can beat you guys Even too. Even though they don't match up well against I don't us. think you'll get there, so it doesn't really matter. But let's say theoretically. I don't do the one ifs. And how about you have some fucking OKC okay, wins. Okay, how many games? Six. Can't let LeBron get seven. Because you know what happens. <laughs> yeah, he's a weirdo. No, I respect that. that. Appreciate um, but the yeah, yeah. I th- So I think really, I, w- I have the Thunder making a second round. Okay. That's, that's my vibe. Uh, their ceiling is the Western Conference Finals. As long as they stay away from the Denver Nuggets side of the bracket, they can legitimately go to the Western Conference Finals. I do believe that. Where I think their road ends is the Denver Nuggets. And I'm trying to respect the OKC as much as possible right now. Me saying that I see no world where Denver loses that series isn't a slight to OKC more so acknowledging the mismatches that are Nikola Jokic against that team. They also have the playoff experience as opposed to them. I just think that the Nuggets are the better team overall. I think that that's where their road ends. But this team is so great. It's undeniable. The offense is amazing. The defense is amazing. They have the star, the superstar player. They meet all the requirements. I just don't believe it's this year for them to go to the NBA Finals. I believe that their ceiling is the Western Conference Finals. This week in the NBA, what do you guys got? So mine is a heartbreaker. Um, it's going to be two of them, uh, but it both injury related. Now, the first one was one that we probably should have acknowledged last show. Scotty Barnes does have a, a fracture in his hand. He's going to miss some time. Now, if you look at the Raptors timeline, understand that you let Scotty Barnes probably for, I'm assuming, probably miss the rest of the season 
get him ready for next season, understand that he was an all-star this year, whether it was Mickey Mouse or not. You have an all-star level player. You've already started the direction of building your team around Scotty. So you could use this as a bittersweet moment. Sucks that Scotty's not going to be able to finish out his best year of his career so far. But at least you can look at the future and understand, hey, we are, we are actually building something, and this is our guy we're building it around. And the last one's going to be Donovan Mitchell. He's going to have to have a shot in his knee. He has an injury where... He's missed the last two games, and now he's going to be missing three more on top of that. So I do have my concerns for the Cleveland Cavaliers in this band. This is where they're going to have to show me what they're made of without Donovan Mitchell. Comes back to the conversation earlier about Darius Garland. Is he going to start being aggressive and close out these games the way that he, the way that he should be doing? How are they going to be looking on the offensive side of the ball? When we understand without Don, that is a genuine question. But it's unfortunate because Don was putting together arguably his best season. He's been playing some unbelievable basketball, and he has the Cleveland Cavaliers in a position to be a top two right now without him being there. With the way that Milwaukee's been playing, a top three seed in the Eastern Conference. So it's tough to see him go out with this injury, of course, but hoping the best for, for Donovan that he's able to get back and be healthy for playoff basketball, which is ultimately what matters the most for Cleveland. All right. So I don't, I don't know. Do you want to go? Because I set it up for... You know, this week in the NBA, do you guys want to do these now? I'm with that. I was thinking we could, like, record it after, but... Cool, I got two of them. So, you know, we can record one after. All right. Also, I'm prefacing this to the fans. Riv gave me the disclaimer that he did this to make me look bad. Or at least try and make it as if I need to do more homework. He wants to test Drew's ball knowledge. So, we're going to see where this goes. We'll do that one after. Okay, well, oh, you I just threw this now? disclaimer out for no reason, then. Oh, okay. Let's so, do it now, because right, so, you already threw out the disclaimer. All right, all right so this is, um, like I said before, grabbing a bunch of NBA players from 2000 to 2010. You know, some of them had cool careers. Some of them just were nice little highlights. Grabbing them, asking you, if you plug them into today's NBA game, would they translate? Being, would they be better or would they be worse? All right? So, first name up, a guy that's been talked about a lot over the last couple of days in Twitter. Andre Karolinko, a.k.a. AK-47. He was a great basketball player. Most definitely he would translate. I feel like, of course, he would translate. I think the defensive versatility that he brings, the slashing to the basket, and he was an average three-point shooter. I think he would translate, and he would be one of the better or one of the best wing defenders in the NBA currently. There we go. Good. I'm glad our bowl knowledge is there. I saw you said all-star. Stamp that? I think um, an all-star in this day and age ain't averaging 16. I don't think he'd average 16. I think he could legitimately average about 18, 19, 20. I think he can get he like I think he can grab a Chris Middleton All Star year. Mm-hmm. No, you know, I think that's serviceable. Okay. Swiss Army guard ones through five. His career high was sixteen and a half points. Okay, so, yeah. and how many threes he took that year? Um, I don't know. Uh, let me check right now. He shot thirty three point five percent that year, though. Uh, he took. 2.6. All right, so you bumped that up for about four or five. Probably to today. Get the 19, yeah. 20 uh-huh. points. You know, see, like we we could talk, we could talk. Um, he'd be like the Scotty Barnes level all star though. He, I said, like I said, he can grab a Chris Middleton all star. Oh, you, know, you he, said Chris Middleton. He, he can grab I'm, one. I'm, one I'm fine with that. Three, you know, next name up, Elton Brand. Okay. No. He so, wouldn't translate. I he, think Elton uh-huh. Brand would be a fine player, even though he's a big body. He he would kind of be like. Fine player is um, so disrespectful. No, no, because he had a great season with the Clippers. He did. Like, he was amazing. I think 25 and 10 that year. He was good with the Bulls, too. Yeah, he was solid. But I think at the time, he was the first overall pick. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of like in the realm of, like, the cat first overall pick, where they're a great player, not necessarily great for being the first overall. You want a little bit more. But what his game was was back to the basket. Mm-hmm. He's a good roller. I just feel like in this game... Uh, he wouldn't have the the shooting ability to really be a threat, a consistent threat, especially in the playoffs. Maybe he wouldn't be the, the level of player he was when he played, but at the same time, there would be a role for him. There would be definitely be, be a spot on multiple NBA teams for Elm Brand. I think that it would translate. Maybe he wouldn't be as prolific as a scorer, but at the same time... It's not translating to a degree, then. No, but I think that his... He was a 20-point per game. He was a no, 20 I understand dude. that. Yeah. I don't know. Andre Drummond was pretty solid for multiple seasons. Yeah. I think his era is more in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I think he's a, you know, back to the basket post up score. He's 90s, early 2000s. Like he reminds me of, and he's, I'm not saying he's this player. 
He reminds me of Jalil Okafor in the sense of the time that we are in now. Just wouldn't suit his game, especially he's not a, a great rim protector, so you can't play him at the center Jaleel fully. Jalil was supposed to be good. Jalil, no, Jalil yeah, he was, had, if he was uh, drafted in 07 or something, mm -hmm. we're here. We're having discussions. Uh, I think Elton Brand will be talked about similarly to like somebody like Julius Randle. So he would be all NBA? Well, there's a negative perception around Julius Randle. Yeah, I think he meant more of that. And I think Julius Randle... Has there been a negative perception on him this season? Um, Sometimes. Really? And I think with Julius Randle, there's, whenever you talk about Julius Randle, you talk it's about never how great he is. It's mm -hmm. like, but. There's always a but yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah. And he is a better shooter, a mid-range shooter. So I feel like, you know, you just... Have like the bully ball aspect Better of it. Better three point shooter too. Yeah. Shit, it's kind of like if Zach Randolph played in this era. Ooh, I love like Zach. he'd be yeah. he'd be solid, but I don't know if he'd be better in yeah. this era. Undersized, big. Next, funny enough, next name up, Al Jefferson. I think he'd be good in this era. Honestly, I, like I feel Al. like with the necessity of bigs, I feel like automatically I'm prone to say yes. A lot of teams need big depth, and I feel like Al definitely would fit that mold. And he was. Fast on his feet. It wasn't too long ago where he was with Utah and led them to the playoffs. I'm with, tripping with or he had a midi. He did. Okay. okay. It wasn't like, it was like a short midi. Uh -huh. uh, he led Charlotte to the playoffs yeah. too. Al was a tough because he was like, he was like Ellen. He was like a post up player. Couldn't really, like nowadays as a big, uh, you do a five, you got to protect the gotcha. rim. Uh -huh. Like your team, sure. you got to be, this big's now more defensive orientated where he was more, I'm, I'm a bucket, I'm an offensive engine. Like give me the ball in the post, I'm going to go get this bucket. Next name up, I think this one's relatively easy. Manu Ginobili. Absolutely. He'd be better. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Next name up, Brandon Jennings. Yes. Yes, because this he, one's he, tricky. Still had, know. he still had the speed. He could shoot the basketball. He could get to the rim. I'm going to say yeah. I don't think so. Uh, I, I seen a 29-point-per-game Isaiah Thomas basically get shown the door out the league <laughs> very soon after. How tall was Brandon? Brandon six was like six, six okay, foot that, six. He's not no five, what, five nine Brandon Isaiah? Jennings was very undersized though. He was and skinny. He was like, he was like me. Yeah. But he still like was me. fast. You know, he's fast as, he's inefficient. So. And I feel like with Brandon Jennings, the it's like, night, it was nuts. I feel like. Put the, him on the Wizards. He has a spot. The type of guard that we're, <laughs> the type of guard that people hate nowadays is what Brandon Jennings is. Yeah. It's just an inefficient shot chucker, bucket getter. Who's undersized and he's can't literally, play defense? He's bone Thailand on steroids times like three. Essentially what he is. Uh, from what I remember Brandon Jennings being, I don't think it would be too far-fetched. But, okay, I understand where you guys are coming Next from. Next name up, Michael Red. He'd be better. He'd be better. He'd you're not, you're better. not feeling that? This one, I, <laughs> I didn't watch much Michael Red highlights. Got him. He'd be better. He was basically... Uh, I know the name, of course, because people love Michael Red. 2K is a big... Uh, drop you the the... the the pass, Michael Red. Here he yeah, is. He, he was um just a left. He was just a bucket getter. Like lefty, left, yeah, lefty. Could shoot the so ball. So I have to tune in. You should tune in for sure. Uh, Lamar Odom, he'd be better. Okay, that's another one. I think I think he'd be a hundred percent better. Milwaukee. Definitely. Yeah, he played. Was he on the team that went against Allen Iverson? Was this two thousand one? Was that like no, his he career? Was, he was that like, was Ray Allen. He was like oh four oh five oh six oh seven. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. He, he wasn't in that. Uh, he was he was playing really well when Milwaukee wasn't really that good. Yeah. He, he was a bucket, My though. God, he was dumb nice. Yeah. All right, so I got to lock in. He was OT. Jeez. got to lock in, bro. I'll be trying to tell you. Oh, you say yes for Lamar Odom? Yeah, I think he'd be better. I think. When, when you're talking to me about translating, I'm kind of mostly basing it off of who's going to be better or worse yes, in this I, era. I, I agree. Okay. I, think, I think Lamar Odom would 100% be better. Mm -hmm. Um, or just give me, I feel like, similar skill set. Can you still perform at the level that you performed when you were playing? Yeah. Okay. I think his would be like, his then would be more important now. Because like he can ball, handle the ball. Ball handling That's four why. or five, you know, uh, can hit the mid-range, can get to the rim. Next name up, Gerald Wallace. Interesting. He'd be worse. He might be, right? He, he reminds me of Sar Thompson. <laughs> Jared Wallace realistically only had like one great. I was going to say I remember him a lot for his time in in Brooklyn, but he played for Charlotte, correct? He was a yeah. elite defender that quite literally can't shoot. Uh, if you can give me defense, elite def defense, no, he was an too, elite defender. I feel like there's always a spot for you. If you can give and me that, the shit give me the, the thirty three percent from three and unbelievable defense. He's not giving. We you can 33% talk percent from three. It was that bad. Let's see. His nickname was Crash. Yo, um. People are gonna be on my neck for not knowing Michael Red. Yeah, like I think that. that's the one that's like nuts that you don't know who Michael Red is. I know the name. I just don't know his game. <sighs> I got him. And he's a lefty. How can I how can I be so 
slept uh, slept on. Uh career mm, not good. Not good. He's given me a few 33s though. Okay. Last name. This one we was just talking about. And I I want I want a legit real answer. 31% from 3. Okay. I didn't know that. I thought it was like lower like 28. Mm-hmm. How would Greg Oden translate in today's <sighs> NBA game? We were I just think he would be it. awesome. I think he'd be awesome when he got drafted in his era. And he was. He was a double-double machine. Injuries just yeah. riddled his career. It's tragic. And I think in this era, you know, you can roll. You can protect the rim. He's not going to bring much shooting. But, you know, he'll be one of the better bigs in the league. I think he'd be a top-ten center today. Now, let me ask you a question, Riv. Do you think I'm an idiot? Wait. I didn't answer the question. Because the answer is yes. Greg Golden, obviously, the size, the strength. I think he'd be he better than Jared Allen by far. Okay, that's that's a great answer. That's probably like he a has top better 13. offensive ability. That's probably like a top thirteen center. But, but do you, you didn't think I know a majority of these guys? No, I said there was a few. I, no, remember when you asked me before? I was, he was like, "Rip, you like you how didn't many think I know about Ellen Brand?" No, no, you said, "Rip, how many do I not know?" And I said three. Who didn't? Who's the three that you thought? Uh, Michael Red. Mm-hmm. That was a good one. Ellen Brand. Respect, that was a good one. Um, Gerald Wallace. Okay. Well, again, I, I I know a lot of him. I knew he was on Charlotte, but my memories of him are in Brooklyn. And I had Corey McGetty up here, but I didn't really want to talk okay. about him. Okay. McGetty. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah. See, so you know. Played for Nuggets? Played for the Clippers. Played for so many Clippers. teams. The okay. Clippers, the Bobcats, the Warriors. he played for Golden State, too. Yes. Yeah. He did. Come on, bro. He played for a ton of teams. What, bro? I, again, like I said, you think I'm an idiot. No, I'm gonna just now. I'm gonna come in here every week and just get, throw you five names. That's fine. I'm cool with that. Actually, right, you make right. me better. All right, we're gonna test your game, man. That's cool. My list is done. All right, that's a great one. Maybe you gotta come in here and start throwing him NFL NFL names. He wouldn't like that. Let's do it. That's a deal. All right. Throw me this era, like 2000 now, though. Don't Fuck you. I didn't throw you no before 2000. Nothing crazy. You're right. You don't didn't. throw me some dude from the. I'm, I'm not. It's not gonna happen. Okay. Dude from the 90s. From when we were alive. That's fair. All right. Oh, 2000. I was expecting people from when we weren't alive. No, no, I wouldn't do that. Okay. I wouldn't do that. I was doing some names that on 2K, you might see them. You're like, oh, mm. let me see how you rock. And then, That's, you know. That was Gerald Wallace for me. That was Michael Red. It should have been. I took way more threes than I should have with Gerald now that you tell me this. Are you serious? I was letting it go. He was making it. Okay. Terrell Davis. He's Please. a running back. For? Denver. Yes. Good. Thank God. That's a Hall of Famer. Oh yeah, okay. Woo! It's no, like that one was the best me. running back of all time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't know his stats, but I know him. He actually was a Hall of Famer off of three years only. Really? Yeah, three All Pro years where they won a championship twice. Had ran, ran for two K, yeah. like bro. He ran for two K. Yeah, I thought it was um Eric Dickerson. Both. Well, he's the record for most okay. yards in a season. Oh, shout out to Terrell Davis. Then. No, uh, when did he play? Dickerson, uh, ninety. Well, he was a part of the championship teams, but like that ninety six to ninety eight. Why well, he only played? Two, two, three well, he was just elite. Oh, okay. He was only elite and then he called it years. quits for really early because he wanted to take care of himself. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That's what's up. Damn. But like unbelievable story. Like, look, hold on, let me look. This should guy. not have been this great. That's insane. Now he was OD. You know who Pierre Thomas is? He's a wide receiver. No, no. Running back for the Saints. Try, try another one. Give me another. Super Bowl winning Saints too. Oh. Him and Reggie Bush shared a backfield. Okay, give me another. Joseph Adai. Running back for who? Chargers. No. Stop. NFC? No. AFC. AFC? Okay. Stop. Stop. It wasn't the Chargers? Joseph Adele. Oh, the Colts. Yes, yeah, Colts. Colts. Well done. <laughs> Fucking cool. Colts. He was in Madden. He was like 88 overall. when He, he played with Payton. Yes. Yeah. yeah he won he a Super Bowl. Oh! He, had he the was t- with them. He had the touchdown that actually gave us the lead against the Patriots in the AFC us? Championship game. Me and Payton. <laughs> yeah, you're sick. Okay. I was so confused. Okay. All right, all right. I like that. Give me another one. Give me another one. I think it went throughout the show. Right. I don't have one right now. Uh, Steven like, Jackson. That's easy. Running back for the Rams. Yeah, okay. that's a gimme. He was a, that has to be husky. a gimme. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you didn't, you've played Madden. You know who Steven Jackson. You know who Jeremy Shockey is? Yes. Tight end for the Chargers. All right. <laughs> what? Oh, no, no. Not the Chargers. No, nah, not the Chargers. Fuck. Wait. You were so confident. I was. I was. No, no, no. I was thinking. Was a uh, tight end? He was, for played sure. Played for two teams, actually. Jeremy. Oh, I, the Giants. Uh-huh. Yes. And what other team? Ah. Uh, he was actually still a dog on this team. Ah, he won a Super Bowl with them, actually. He, he won did. a Super Bowl with them? Yeah. I, I, I won't get the second I will team. give you a mega hint. Okay. You said the Chargers? Mm-hmm. His quarterback played for them. The Colts? No. Wait. It wasn't Phillip Rivers? No. Did he play for Arizona? Now, nah, see, now nah, I'm getting him in his bag now. Does he know that this quarterback played for this team? 
I don't know. There's a chance. I wish there was a way to quiz him without like telling him the answer. This quarterback played for the Chargers <sighs> that Jeremy Shockey won the championship with. This quarterback played with the Chargers and uh, went on to have a great, great career. After or before he won? After. After. But, so, well, when he won, he was elite. So he, he, won, with he, he won with the new team. Yeah. But before that, he played with the Chargers. Yeah. Correct. And him and Shockey went to the new team. No, not just, not, well, yes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, so, Shockey let's joined him eventually. Let's yeah, not okay. Let's yeah, not yeah, confuse yeah, yeah. Him. He just, But just, they, they were there. They both okay, went right. to this team. Fuck. Who? All right. So you played for the Chargers. God damn. The quarterback played for yes, the Chargers. Yes, the quarterback played for the Chargers. That after he left, he won a ring. He mentored Phillip Rivers. Oh, shit. Drew Brees. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Drew Brees. Oh, so the Saints. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, all right. Drew Brees, he did play for the Chargers. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. All right. I should have known that. All right, well done. You know who Michael Turner is? The running back for the Falcons. He was Facts. a legend. Facts. He was dumb, nice, and mad. Okay. Okay, I'm glad. I should have known the Brees one. I, I got I got a lot. That's there. okay. I, My This Week in the NBA... Uh, SGA, only three players in NBA history. He named have, a lot of running backs. He was just like running backs. You better tell me them. <laughs> <laughs> only three players in NBA history have achieved thirty plus points per game, five plus assists, five plus rebounds, and two plus steals per game on fifty percent field goal shooting in a season. SGA this year, Steph Curry in twenty sixteen, and Michael Jordan in nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine, and ninety ninety one, and ninety two. So what SGA oh is doing this year? God. Is uh, some historic company, and then this other this week in the, in the NBA I got is that the Wolves have the worst clutch offensive rating in the NBA since Christmas. Damn. So since Christmas, a lot to figure out. Kyle Anderson. So let's wrap back to a conversation. Um, By the Minnesota way, this Terrell Davis dude is nuts. No, he had four years of being. He had a lot of attempts. Four hundred. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, he I did. See why he left. Um, Concern level with the Minnesota Timberwolves, 1 to 10. 10 being you're fucking scared out of your mind. Mm. I think right now... They would play the Suns as of today. Oh, the Suns? Yes. Well, my concern for them and the Suns is like a, maybe four. You know, but uh, four or five. Let's go, let's go down the teams real quick. Let's, let's, let's have a little fun, right? I'll just say it in an umbrella. In an umbrella, it's a seven. Okay. So I think there's there's concern for the Timberwolves. That sounds like a lot of concern. How about, I mean, yeah, there is. Against OKC, what would the level be? Seven. Nuggets. Eight. Clippers. Six. I'm going to, uh, I got to show them respect. The Pelicans. Five. Even can, though the, t- the, can Pelicans, the Pelicans upset them, the Pelicans play them better than a lot of the teams. The Pelicans can upset them. The Kings? Like a two. Yeah, two. Can you respect three. the Kings? I, I think the Timberwolves beat I don't. Because they just beat them. No, I'm saying, but defensively, I know. I don't. Anthony Edwards left he, at halftime. Yeah, he did. Uh, Suns? Like a five. And then the final team, Dallas? I think that's like a, like a six. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, you're pretty much. That's a six. I right, Thank you for being honest. Yeah. Any that's team six. outside of. So basically, any team outside of OKC. And the Pelicans, you have comfortable faith that Minnesota will be all right. And Nuggets, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you had about, because you had about six for most of the teams. Okay. Yeah, I think they'll be all right against most teams. Is this the best Western Conference ever? No, not even close. It's one of the, you know, this is a stack close. No, I think early 2000s, a little bit before that, when they had teams, Tem C being 44 wins, that was death better. I mean, that's probably what it's about to be. Maybe. Let me go double, let me go double back. The one that comes to mind is the one that the Kings didn't make the playoffs. The year that the Clippers were the AFC. I mean, you had a year in the West where you had a Kobe-led Lakers, Tim Duncan-led Spurs, both great rosters, the Nuggets with Carmelo Anthony, the Rockets with Yao Ming and T-Mac when they were healthy. They're playing play well. The Jazz with Carlos Boozer, Darren Williams, Mamedo Kerr, Karolinko. They had a really good team. The Hornets with Chris Paul for sure, and David West. Yeah, so you uh, had, yeah, they got a, they had a lot of great teams. Utah, this is 07, The 08. Suns, Nash, and Stoudemire. 07, 08, Utah 154, Denver 150, Portland 141. They were just banged up. Yeah, the, the Blazers. Sun, the Lakers 157, the Suns 155, the Warriors 148, the Hornets 156, the Spurs 156, the Rockets 155. God damn. Yeah, the Southwest was crazy. Oh, my time. God. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I would still take those other teams. Mm-hmm. But other uh, other years, but this West, the West has always been great. Last question I'll ask because I've been asking a lot of questions of this show. Um, do you wish divisions meant something? They used to. I definitely do. I wish 
rivalries meant something. Like we had r- legit real rivalries. Like when like Kobe and them boys used to go up to, you know, Darren Williams in Utah, or they go up to Steve Nash and feet. Like they were legit. Those were legit, right? Or like even in the East when you had Dwight going to or uh, Boston, you had LeBron and the Cavs going up there, mm-hmm. or like you had Indiana and stuff. Like it was uh, Indiana and the Bulls playing. Like I wish we had. I wish divisions matter, but I wish rivalries played a part. Like we had a little sneak peek when we had Memphis and the Warriors, mm-hmm. Memphis and Minnesota. They looked like they legitimately didn't like each other. Yep. You know, um, Denver and the Lakers for a little bit. For sure, the Clippers and the Lakers. Like we, we have some a few, but none of it is real. Like I, I feel like we forced them. Yeah. Like Miami and the Bucks is probably the real Miami ones. and Boston. Miami right. and they've Boston. always been a rival. But now the new one, Bucks and Pacers. I feel like that's Sports. one that they're trying to yeah. make happen. Yeah, I think Miami and Boston they've always been rivals. So it's yeah, easy. agreed. Same thing with um the Bucks and and the Heat. Yeah. Uh, as of recent, most definitely Bucks and Boston. So I like the divisions don't really matter in the NBA. Really? Yeah, because um if we were to go by divisions, let's just say like the format is the three best teams in a division get the top seeds and then the next, the second ones after that, get the other three. And then there's like two wild cards. The, the bracket would be OKC one Clippers two, Pelicans three. Then it would be Minnesota four. Um, Denver five. The Kings are Dallas six. One of those two. And then the wild cards would be like, um, the Suns, Warriors, and Lakers between those three. So the Pelicans would pretty much be a top three seed in the West if mm-hmm. we went by divisions. Ew. And if we went by divisions in... Respect uh, the Pelicans? Sorry. If we went by divisions in the East, the Celtics, Bucks, and Magic would be the top three. The Magic would be like the Sounds Bucks. Sounds cool. In the, uh, the, uh, the NFL. But the Heat and the Magic are you know right next to each other. Yeah, so yeah. it could be Celtics, Bucks, Heat, or Celtics, Bucks, Magic, one of those three. But yeah, I kind of like that we don't have divisions. I get because, it. It's unique. Yeah. It's unique. Because they matter somewhat for like tiebreakers, but for the NFL, it's just a little bit different. Mm-hmm. It, I feel like maybe, you know, it's just been that but way I say for that so for long. For baseball, there's no, there's no. Divisions? Di- well, there is divisions, but I mean in the sense like the conferences where they just break it up 15 versus 15, yeah. where baseball, it's heavy on the, hey, you, if you are, let's say, just slightly above 500. You can still host a playoff series because you won your your division. To me, I feel like I'm fine with that, but I understand it's unique for for basketball. So I'm I'm I'll, I'm it's also only, okay only, with it's that. Only, I think because divisions are uneven. It's only three. Mm-hmm. Like NFL, it's easier. It's four divisions. You have yeah. four you know four division leaders, so they automatically get in. And then you got the baseball. Three. If I'm not mistaken, it's three also. Yeah, that would be, that's crazy. I feel like for the most part, um, when it comes to not having divisions. I feel like it forces teams to build the best possible roster because in the NFL, there's a lot of teams that, okay, I'll play in the AFC North. Let's say I'm the Cincinnati Bengals. Well, in the first round, instead of taking the best player available, I need somebody that's going to block Miles Garrett. So, you know, who you draft and who you sign is very reliant on the teams you're going to face. You know, I'm seeing Miles Garrett twice a year. I need somebody to block him. If I'm in a division like that, I'm seeing TJ Watt and Miles Garrett four times. I need somebody that's going to block them. Yep. So, you know, you start drafting more so to match up against your division rivals instead of just matching up across the league. But then again, you know, I think that brings uniqueness to to teams and divisions because in the NFL, I feel like you can go down the list and, you know, there's a kind of like style that each division goes into. You know, the AFC North is more like gritty uh, and there are certain divisions that just have more identity to them, and that's probably because of that, you know, mm-hmm. because of how they draft. The Milwaukee Bucks, as of recently, have been finding their stride. Second in the East, 40 and 21, five game win streak. They fired Adrian Griffin, 17 games over 500. People question that. Um, I think Doc Rivers is a good coach, and I mean, I don't think that's saying much. He's one of the like all time winning his coaches. Um, I just feel like when Doc Rivers gets talked about, it's always about his shortcomings. And, well, he only has one championship. Mm-hmm. But realistically, how many coaches in the history of the NBA have a championship? You know, we don't say that for somebody like Dirk Nowitzki. We don't say, oh, Dirk just got one championship. Well, what what was, did he do in what, the other years? The last how many games was that? Five, they're on a five-game Five-game win streak. Okay. Uh, they've had Doc Rivers coaching this team for 15 games. 
fifth in defensive rating, 18th in offensive rating. In seven of the last nine games, they've held opponents under 100 points. One thing is clear. You know, Doc Rivers is a clear upgrade over Adrian Griffin. The defense Griffin was trying to employ, being ultra aggressive at the point of attack, bringing up Brooke Lopez and Giannis, it removed them from protecting the rim. Doc Rivers understands the strengths of this team. The strength is that we have length. We have Giannis and Brooke Lopez. We have to have one of those two at all times around the rim protecting it. And you've seen Doc Rivers employ a bunch of defensive schemes. Brooke Lopez is back to dropping. Giannis is roaming. They're connected on defense. They're switching. Every single ball screen, they're, they're switching those ball screens. And they're just having one of those guys close to the basket to stop buckets. And Adrian Griffin made it a point of emphasis for wings to get offensive rebounds, to crash the glass, where Doc Rivers is, you know, you get back on transition on defense, and that's why now they're a great transition defense versus Adrian Griffin. They were one of the worst. The offense is worse as of right now, but I think that's not even a concern for me. Like mm -hmm. Doc Rivers has maximized offenses almost everywhere he's went. He did it with Harden and Embiid, and the fact that he got the defense back on track. If this team goes into the playoffs and are top 10 in offense and are top 10 in defense, I mean, I think we can applaud Doc Rivers for the job that he's done coming into this team and changing them uh, around. You're funny. How am I funny? Hey, Drew, you want to hear something funny? I would Let's love look to. at the last seven games. It's so funny you say that because that's my exact same argument here, too. They played the Bulls. Whatever. It's a good win. They played Charlotte it's three times in this span. They played... The 76ers, no Joel Embiid. Um, they played the Timbs, great win. Yes. Elite, that's the 13 best 13 points win. In, in, in the third quarter. They lost to the Grizzlies. The before that the was on February break. 15th. And they lost to the Heat. They got their ass whipped. And I, if I'm not mistaken, Jimmy didn't play in this game? I don't think so. Let me make sure. It, you know, it, 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 their defense has gotten better, but I think that's more because of the he teams did. they've played. You know, they've held Charlotte under 100 points three times. You know, Charlotte scored 85 and then 99 both games, so that's going to limit you. And then the Bulls didn't score 100 points. So you've you've had some, you know, easy offenses to play against. Um, they played Denver and held them to 95 with Jokic and Murray playing. Listen, that, that's an impressive one. And I think this next stretch, you know, they got the Clippers right now. They're down seven, but Giannis isn't playing. So whatever. Um, they got this road trip, Warriors, Lakers, Clippers, Kings. So I think that that road trip is tough. You know, it's the, all the Cali teams. You know, the Warriors are a top offense. The Clippers are a top offense. The Kings are a top offense. You know, the Lakers are just a tough team at home. So, like, this is really the stretch that I'm looking for. You know, I think beating the, like, beating the teams you're supposed to beat is cool and all. But I think this stretch next up is really going to tell me more about what this defense looks like. You know, I think especially against the Golden State team that's been firing on, on cylinders, against the Lakers, against the Clippers. Hopefully Giannis does play for this trip. You know, I would like to see him play because he's, he's not playing. He's been out of his yeah, mind. He's not playing yeah. tonight, unfortunately. But um, I hope to see him in this trip because then we can really get a def like a, 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 a definitive answer. A definitive answer for this Bucks team because it's, it's only going to get tougher. Because after that, they got the Sixers, they got the Suns, then they got Boston. So it it doesn't get easier. Th these next seven games is the games you really should have been looking for, not these games against you know the Hornets and the, the Bulls. Yeah, now, the Riff, uh, I'm standing with you right here. Uh, oh. It, before I finish, after the Nets, which is a walkthrough, they got OKC, the Lakers, and the Pelicans. So this next 11, 12 games. Now, this is really where we identify rough. where the Bucks or where the Bucks really stand amongst the elite teams. Now, I, I say this with the idea that we still haven't seen Dame get it together. In this five-game heater, we still haven't seen Dame be consistent. Ironically enough, this game versus the Bulls where we saw Giannis be the dominant force that he's been this entirety of the season. A little tidbit for you. The last 20 games, Giannis is shooting 60% from the field and 40% from three. Obviously, we know the volume of the, the three-point shooting is low. But nevertheless, he's been just unbelievably efficient but dominant. And just one of the best interior presence we've seen this game have. But really, what has been honest, uh, what's been awesome about him is all the things that you mentioned about Adrian Griffin doing wrong and Doc Rivers doing right. It just didn't take a rocket scientist to understand that you had a history of these things working for you. Why are we trying to change up in that regard when we don't have the personnel for that anymore? If that was one you wanted to instill, maybe last year with the def different defensive personnel. But now you got to understand different skill sets, understand that this team needs to be 
uh, just have different identity on the defensive side of the ball. Brooks not getting any younger. Don't put him in strenuous situations. Similar with Bobby Portis, too, where that's where he was great, dropping back and, and being aggressive on the boards. But if you force him to fight through screens, that's where you lose his his ability on that side of the ball. To me, I look at this defense and, and like that it's trending in the right direction. But again, I am also looking at the talent that they've played, and I am acknowledging that game versus Nug the Nuggets. I am acknowledging that game versus the Timberwolves. But we just sat here, and multiple times throughout the show, we've acknowledged Minnesota's offense is not that good. But that Nuggets move, that Nuggets win, that moved me most definitely. But then the dropping the game after to Jimmy to a Jimmy Butler list Miami Heat, that's where I still need to see some games and still need to 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 wait on my full evaluation of the Doc River led uh, Milwaukee Bucks. I do like to see them on a heater on a, on a nice win streak, but we saw them on heaters with Adrian Griffin. So that's why I'm still remaining patient. I love the fact that Giannis is still having his name in the MVP discussion because deservedly so. We may not see another efficient player like this for some time or unless Zion decides to wake up and be uh, the dominant scorer that he once was, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. His game has been uh, a little altered recently. But Milwaukee is still one of those that you have to respect because they have arguably the best player in the world, however you want to shake it. I still think Jokic deserves that respect as the best in the world. But shit, he's heard that that criticism. He said it, hey, I hear what you guys are talking about. I'm going to come back better next. And we're seeing it. We're seeing Giannis play better than he did last year because he's a better playmaker. He's been working on that for years in his game, but we've really seen it come to fruition this season. Uh, so there's things to still be optimistic about with Milwaukee, but... We have to see how they look on these next span of games before going all in or, or going all out because they face some really tough challenges here. And if they can go and, and, and win a majority of these games, then we're really talking about them in a positive light going into the playoffs. I don't think it's about going all in or being all out. I think it's about noticing that this team has improved. Granted, the competition hasn't been the best, but they've had games in there where the teams they did face, you know, they did have an impressive showing against. And it's about just acknowledging that now that Doc Rivers is here, they got a better chance at accomplishing what they want to accomplish. It's as simple as that. And with Doc Rivers in Philadelphia, number one seed first year, he gets to Philadelphia. You know, Harden and Embiid made that parent work. and Embiid was just hurting the playoffs. And, you know, I think this Bucks team, they're better. And I think the messaging being mm -hmm. clear and the game plans being clear has helped players. You know, I think this is something that I expect from every coach, but, uh, you know, I don't think Griffin did it, but Doc Rivers sat with every player when he got to Milwaukee, according to Chris Haynes. He sat down with every player and he Chris told Haynes them. really plugged in. Man. Yeah, he is with Dame. That's yeah, who he's plugged yeah. in with. Uh, and he sat down with every player and told them what he wants them doing and what he doesn't want them doing. And I think him being concise and clear with the roles has given this team structure and that's what helps them. You know, the record is better with Adrian Griffin, but quite frankly, this is a, this is a scenario where process is better than results. Yep. You know, the record ain't better with Doc Rivers, but they're, they're a better team. You, you think they, uh, they still have a chance? Like, are you out on them still? Or are you, you changing to them? The Celtics are just so overwhelmingly favorites, bro. Like, you know, to the, in the East, you think they can still make the ECF? Um, yeah. I mean, the East is wide open after, after Boston, you know, I think Miami and them would be a tough series. Can still. I ask you a question? In the short stint that we've seen with Milwaukee, what's been more impressive, uh, Doc Rivers' time with Milwaukee or what Nick Nurse has done with a Philadelphia team led without Joel Embiid? I think what Nick Nurse is doing is more impressive as mm -hmm. a whole and what how he got Embiid to play. So I think Nick Nurse has been better this year, there's no doubt. But I think Doc Rivers came into a tough situation, and he's you know made the most of it. I know. Do you think it was a tough situation? Because Adrian Griffin was winning games. It is a tough situation. I mean, a, a coach gets fired midseason, and they were winning games, but you were winning shootouts against the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> like, that, to me, is not <laughs> like, a good a basketball. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, that is, you're supposed to rest Giannis in the, in the fourth quarter, and they don't got to do much, and they were getting into shootouts. Uh, it's funny because the results the Bucks are getting on defense, they're pretty much running the same defense that Mike Budenholzer ran. You yep. know, so this isn't much different. Uh, so there is a concern about this team, whether their their defense will translate to the playoffs. But I do think getting Patrick Beverly was huge, even if it's just for somebody being there, being accountable mm -hmm. and bringing energy. I think that's something they needed, just more veterans on the team. And the toughness 
they get comes from, I think, mostly Bev and Jay Crowder, who are two guys that for their career have been known to be, you know, tough players. But I think what Doc Rivers is doing with the Bucks is impressive. You know, it's a tough situation to come into. I got you. I'm with you. You want to you say something about Doc Rivers? No, not really. Again, I already said what needed to be said. I'm going to sit and wait to, to really be moved uh, by a consistent span of games against tough competition before I give any credit or take away any credit. Uh, because, being honest, they really haven't played anyone tough outside of Minnesota. And, and again, we understand Minnesota's offense is not good. So the best win, not taking it away from them, obviously, I'm not trying to do that, but just being honest for a second, their best win in this five-game span is against a team right now, one of the better teams that has an obvious deficit on that side of the ball that we're looking for Milwaukee to address. So at least they still answered the call, and and it didn't look as if, oh, they're playing a bad defense. Now Minnesota suddenly is playing great. So we, we can acknowledge and give them credit there, but at the same time, Minnesota's had these struggles for a little bit now. We just happened to have Milwaukee catch them at that time and put together an impressive performance. So let me ask you something then, because you asked me that question about Milwaukee. Yeah. Giannis is going to play at an MVP level regardless. Easy. If Dame figures it out, what do you think about them? I think their, their ceiling is the ECF. So there's no... If, if Dame plays at the All-NBA level said, you expect him to play... I think I've said this before. For Giannis them, as an MVP, you, there's no world they beat the Celtics. No, I, I think I, I the think Celtics win. If, for, and I think I said it before the Bucs. For the Bucs to be Boston, Giannis and Dame have to go nuclear. Have to. They have to no, go like nuclear. No, like otherworldly. Yeah, best like, two players in the world type. Like, like clearly the two best players yeah, in the yeah, series yeah, 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 for yeah. them to... You know, so... It, it, I'm not saying it can't happen, but... Man, it's Dame, who, yeah. Dame who scares yeah, me. I think Giannis him. will be fine. That's asking a lot of him, though. You know, I think the they team took him to seven with no middle team. Boston's way better than they, what they were in. They the are, series. and I don't think the Bucks are way better. You know, I think if they were healthy that year versus this right now, that Porzingis Brook Lopez matchup could get ugly. They don't have any defenders. Like their best defense. Like they, 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 I'm watching the game right now. They have Dame on the zone. They're in the zone right now. Dame is on Kawhi's side. Yikes. No, that's bad. That's not what you want. <laughs> what are they doing? I don't know. And then they play in man. That's, and that's what they got. They play in man and Dame was guarding quad. It's like, bro. That's what they got. Tatum and Brown should have fun that series. Oh, yeah. But they've shown, you know, they get a little inconsistent at times, of course. But I not against Milwaukee. Fun. Well, I guess that's not true. We saw him game one not be the best. Yeah. Back when Adrian Griffin was still on a team, uh, they were in the playing tournament uh, or the in season tournament, I should say. And the Pacers got the best of them. And now is at a time where Tyrese Halliburton was playing out of his world, averaging 29, 12, efficiency, 53% from the field, 47% from three. This is when he was getting Steve Nash comparisons. But as of recently, in, in 16 stuff, never forget. In the month of February. Jesus, people went that far? Yes. In the month of February, 12 games, he's averaging 16 points, nine assists, shooting 48% from the field and 38% from three. Not terrible numbers, but not numbers that you want to see from a player of his caliber. And really the question is, you know, what's going on with Tyrese Halliburton? What's going on with him, Riv? Is well, he is he coming back down to earth? Well, for starters, he's banged up, of course. Yes. Um, you always got to add that. But two, his self-creation is not the best. It's not, you know, he, he still struggles to create his own bucket. Um, and I think teams are starting to figure him out a little bit. You know, that, that system is a beautiful offensively run system. You know, you've seen TJ McConnell get his fair share. You've seen... And he said it. He he he, he said. It. I forgot wh where he said that. But he said he can't play without Buddy Hill. Or like it's really hard to play without Buddy Hill. You know, Buddy Hill definitely that opens was up. Such the, a questionable move yeah. when they made it. Buddy Hill definitely opens up the floor for them. But I think more just talking internally about Alliburton. I think the league is caught up to him a little bit and just him being injured while his creation not being at the high level guards that it is. I know he was putting up twenty seven and twelve, but you know a lot of that was just pick and roll work and him getting in transition. Getting a couple looks, his half court self creation still needs a little bit of work, and I, I'm I don't think this is a bad thing. You know, I think this is just a, you know, something all point guards go through. You know, or something all stars go through. I think you know we were talking about in the Discord the other day. Halley is low key injury prone. Like he's starting to get a series of back to back injuries that's starting to hamper with him. You know, last year he had an injury; he was out for the year, or the rest of the year, and then this year he's dealing with a bunch of nagging injuries that's now messing up his play. The Pacers have been falling you know they're not this the same team they were since the play-in tournament and I think you know they're an eighth seed right now they were six five 
hovering. Now they're in the play in their AFC. They're right under Miami. You know, so this is a team that very well could fall out the play-in. You know, this is a team that very well could not make the playoffs. You know, it's a team that has to figure it out. The Siakam getting there, you know, it hasn't been all love and peaches and cream. But at the same time, Hadley hasn't been playing at that same level. You know, and this defense is completely, it's just bad. It's just not good. You know, and I think it's more a credit because the way their offense runs that it's hard to really play defense. But at the same time, you know, I think Hadley would get past this stretch. We definitely, as a community, went a little too far in December and November, pushing these comparisons to, you know, Steve Nash and stuff like that, you know, after 20-something games. I think now that he's come down to earth, people are starting to jump on him. But in reality, it's just we should have waited until the end of the year, you know. What's been a huge credit to Tyrese has been his efficiency. These last two games, he had a, he had a game versus the Pelicans where Herb had him in hell, zero zero shots made from the field. Uh, but these last two games combined, zero for 12 from the three-point line. That's really what's been the most shocking to me, really, just the fact that we're, we're starting to see this injury really take a toll on on his scoring output. Uh, but it's not just the injury. They're also, like Riv mentioned, throwing different looks at him. He's getting blitzed more often. Uh, the, the Pacers are also not running as many pick and rolls as they were earlier on in the season. Uh, but what's really interesting is that you need Tyrese Halliburton to play at, at at the superstar level that he was playing at earlier on in the season because you made the move for Pascal Siakam because you thought you had a superstar player in Ty- Tyrese Halliburton. So you try to speed up the process by bringing in a Pascal Siakam. But now we're seeing post-injury Tyrese not be the same dominant offensive engine. But in reality, the Pacers need him to continue to be the system because without Tyrese Halliburton, we understand this is the main reason. This is the number one guy that they run their offense through. And it's not like as if they're, they've dropped off dramatically. They went from being the number one offense in the league to being still a top two, top three offense in terms of offensive rating. But my concern with not just Halliburton, but just with the Pacers has always been this defense is not good. So if I evaluate the Pacers on just that level alone where you have Tyrese Halliburton struggling, your defense already is garbage, how can we really look at you other than a first-round exit? Where Riz already talking about potentially them not even making the playoffs. Because they're AFC. You know, I gotta. With no, which is fine. I understand where you're coming from. But that's how serious the conversations have gotten where if you don't have Tyrese Halliburton on, your offense takes a hit. But the main reason why you have been one of the better teams in the East or earlier on in the season, why you were one of the better teams in the East, was because your offense was historic and it was masking how terrible of a defense you are. But if Halliburton's going to be bad and your defense is going to be bad, then his concerns are completely valid. But I do anticipate that he starts to figure it out as the season does progress. It's about learning. He's still a young player. This is the first season where... The league's acknowledging him as a star in this league. So naturally, you start to get different coverages. It's just going to be a matter of him adjusting, the team adjusting, and ultimately them recuperating on the offensive side of the ball because without Halliburton, there's no real conversation to be had about Indiana. I think Tyler Halliburton is going to be fine. Yeah. And I think the first step that he had is kind of zapped because of his injury right now, and it's kind of hard for him to get to his spots. Um he does have to play defense. He has to get better on that end. That's number one. I don't think Rick Carlisle is that great of a coach. And I say that because it's obvious that he picks his favorites. I think he's a big fan of Andrew Nemhard. Uh, Andrew Nemhard could have slumps and he would not care. And there are other players on the Pacers. I'm mostly talking about Benedict Matherin, who he just can't seem to do things right. And Mm -hmm. that's because Rick Carlisle, I guess, expects too much for him or just there's no room for error with Matherin. Matherin can have a 30-point game, and the next game, Rick Carlisle will now be satisfied and wants him to reduce whatever he was doing. And it kind of reminds me, in a sense, of Steve Kerr with Kaminga and how he's holding him back. I think Benedict Matherin is better than 15 a night. I think he can start on his team, and I think he should start on his team. The fact that he's coming off the bench after... I think he's shown enough to be a starter, especially with Buddy Heald, you know, now leaving town. I just feel like Benedict Matherin hasn't given a fair, hasn't been given a fair shake. Mm-hmm. And then Jarris Walker coming in. You know, I think Jarris Walker, he hasn't played much, and I think he's probably a better fit for o- than, than Obi Toppin. But Rick Carlisle wants to maximize offense, so he puts in 
OB topping over him, but Jared Sparker has been playing a little bit more. I think the deficiencies with this team mostly uh, lies with Miles Turner and him not being a true big man. You know, he's not somebody that is a great defender. And if he's your five, I understand he can stretch the floor, he can shoot. But defensively, he's not going to be much of a resistance. He's not going to resist players from coming to the basket. He's not going to make a big impact on that end. And I do think them trading Buddy Heald for essentially nothing was a loss. You know, this is one of the best shooters in the league. Yep. And you traded him and now was making Tyrese Halliburton's life worse. You bring in Pascal Siakam. Pascal's playing well. He really has uh, been. But... Pascal is also a guy that the ball sticks with him. He's not somebody that's moving the ball a ton. And you see that with Toronto and how they're playing now. Toronto is passing the ball much more. They're playing much more free. And with Pascal, that's why even when we talked about him maybe getting traded to OKC, I didn't love that because I think he's a weird fit next to other stars. He's done it before with Kawhi, but that was a little bit different. You know, he was still finding his way. He was an MIP, not a proven all-star. At this stage in his career, he can demand what he wants to demand. And he's been fine for them. He has been. But I, I don't know if that was the move to maximize them. Maybe we'll see more next year. Yep. Because be when, yeah, when Fox and Sabonis got paired up the first year, you know, it wasn't it was all that. Well, yeah. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand. Fair enough. It wasn't all that. It was at until, the trade deadline. Yeah. Gotcha. It was the next year when they had the offseason together. Off. Yep, you know, for sure. They took off. So good maybe point. that's a similar really story to the Pacers with Siakam and Tyrese. But to this point, I, I just feel like Halliburton needs to get healthy. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I kind of been disappointed with him because I think he was complaining a little bit too much. Um, he was complaining about the 65 game rule. And at this point, you see him. He's going out there playing through injury. Because he wants to get to the 65-game threshold so he can get the accolades of being an all-NBA player, one of those. And I respect that and understand that. But at the same time, you cannot complain about it. You cannot use that as an excuse as to why you're playing poorly because you're playing through something. If you're going to be out there, you're going to play, Ball you got to perform. It's you. simple as that. And if, if it's affecting his play to that degree... He got to sit out and he got to make a business decision and a health decision. Mm -hmm. And he got to wait until he's fully healthy to play at his level, regardless of a 65 game stipulation. I also want to pair that with the idea that this is a tryout for Pascal Siakam, given the hope that he does resign. You gave him three first. You want him to come back. I think Halliburton understands that. Hey, if I don't suit up also and I don't show this guy that I can play at the all NBA play all NBA level that I've obviously shown I can play at, there's a chance that I kind of fucked my team over and I might lose my co-star. So I feel like that also goes hand in hand with it too. But I don't disagree too much. I just think that if you are healthy enough to play, you're naturally going to play. And I think that I don't see a world where if Halliburton's not at, at worst... 70 percent that he's not going to go out there he's going to go out there he's a warrior he wants to be out there playing some some basketball because he also understands his team's in a position that for the first time he can make the playoffs i think that he sees that and understands that he wants to wants to be a part of that moment and show the world because he like he showed in the in season tournament originally that i'm made for these types of moments but it's it's an unfortunate situation where at uh, at crunch time we're starting to see him kind of deteriorate now, is this telling of how he is as a player? Because we saw last season that he couldn't hold up. And he got injured at, at some point in the season last year when he came back. The, uh, the Pacers obviously weren't the same team. Are we seeing this re history rewritten again? Where last, where this season, they're playing some high-level basketball. He goes down with the hamstring injury. He's coming back. He's not that same player. It's, it's, it's not something that you like to see, especially as something that's been reoccurring. Andrew Nemhart is still starting over Benedict Matherin. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like that should be the case. Mm -hmm. Like, I really don't. And uh, not saying that this player would have became good, but I know Luca had friction with Rick Carlisle yeah. early in Dallas because of how Rick Carlisle treated Dennis Smith Jr. Dennis Smith Jr. was a lottery pick. He was supposed to be better than what he was, and he had a coach in Carlisle who gave him a short leash and really, I feel like, stunted his growth. And I hope that doesn't happen with Matherin because I think Matherin could be a hell of a player. Mm -hmm. And he could be a great second scorer next to Tyrese or third now that they got, now that they got Siakam. <laughs> so I, I just want to see him get more of an opportunity because I feel like he could be a great player in this league. Yeah, there's some talent on this roster. They just need to to find an yeah, identity. Find an identity, yeah. but defensively. 
Because offensively, you have the talent, obviously. But defensively, it can't be that you're a bottom five defense in the league. It's not going to translate to playing winning basketball. It's simply not. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Pick a Side Podcast, episode 359. You guys can follow us on Twitter at Pick a Side Pod, on Instagram and TikTok at Pick a Side Podcast. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.